outside the hearing of the jury uh, we have one issue to deal with this morning um, and we're going to deal with that off audio and off video but it will be on the record and the press can remain and report on what is going on in the courtroom but it will not be broadcast outside this room so if you could get the juror for us 
state may call us next witness. Good morning, Your Honor, Council, ladies and gentlemen. The state will call for their first witness, Dr. Lindsay Thomas. Swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. I do, yes. And Dr. Thomas, if you feel comfortable doing so, we'd ask you to remove your mask. I will keep mine on. I would love that. Thank you. And uh, let's begin by having you state your full name, spelling each of your names. Uh, Lindsay, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y, Carol, C-A-R-O-L, Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S. Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Dr. Thomas. Good morning. Would you please tell us what kind of a doctor you are? I'm a forensic pathologist. And what is a forensic pathologist? Uh, forensic pathology is that branch of pathology, which is a branch of medicine, where medicine and law overlap. So it could be anything with a medical and legal component, could be toxicology. In some cases, it may involve living patients, but as I practice and as most forensic pathologists practice, it involves what's called medical legal death investigation. Uh, does it involve taking care of patients in the clinical sense? Not living patients, no. I, a, a forensic pathologist may be consulted to help with the evaluation and interpretation of injuries in a living patient, but not in a treatment or clinical sense. So most of your work then is done on deceased people? Correct. Uh, any specific types of deaths? Yes, uh, the state statutes lists the types of deaths that have to be reported to the medical examiner. And briefly, they tend to be unnatural deaths, so accidents, suicides, homicides, unexpected deaths, potentially suspicious deaths, uh, that type of uh, category of death. Do you get special training in how to determine the cause and manner of death? In yes. Uh, Tell us something about the special training you received. Well, should I start back in medical school or just, <laughs> <laughs> just the end part? Just the end part. Okay. Um, I did a fellowship in forensic pathology, which is a specified training program for doctors who want to be forensic pathologists to learn how to do medical legal death investigations and certify cause and manner of death. So would you tell us what pathology is as a field of medicine? Sure. Um, pathologists are sometimes considered the doctor's doctor because we don't directly treat patients, but we provide information to doctors who then do treat patients. So, for example, if you've ever been to a lab and had blood, blood drawn, that goes to a laboratory that is run by a pathologist, a clinical pathologist. So you know, blood count, uh, chemistries, things like that. Or if you've ever known someone that had a biopsy and was diagnosed with cancer, that's the type of pathology um, that is done by an anatomic pathologist. So you'd look at tissue and under the microscope and make diagnoses. Is a medical examiner a forensic pathologist? In Minnesota, a medical examiner is a forensic pathologist who is appointed by the County Board of Commissioners to be that county's medical examiner. So it's a public official? Yes. So when you talk about the medical legal investigations, uh, is that uh, sort of a fancy way of describing mm -hmm. what forensic pathologists do? Yes, it's what the medical examiner's office does. It's death investigations, again, where they're is a medical component and there may be a legal component. Is it different from, say, uh, a death in a hospital? Yes, so if someone dies in a hospital, those are usually deaths due to natural causes and they may have a medical death investigation in the sense that a hospital pathologist might do an autopsy, 
but they wouldn't do the full scope of the medical legal death investigation because those are mostly due to natural diseases. What does death investigation entail? Well, <clears throat> the way a medical examiner's office performs a death investigation, I think a lot of people assume it's all about the autopsy, the physical examination of the body, and that's really just a tiny part of the death investigation. The death investigation really starts uh, at the very beginning when a death is found, a person is found deceased, or the office is notified of the death. We, as medical examiners, want to know all about that person. What's their past medical history, social history, family history? So we will do whatever we need to do to get that kind of history. Then we want to know well, what happened, what were their terminal events? What happened around the time of their death? Were they complaining of something? Were they interacting with someone? Were they driving? Were they using you know, uh, machinery, something like that? And then uh, we'll look at the physical examination, and that part of the exam might include x-rays. It could include getting specimens for toxicology, for cultures, for all kinds of other laboratory tests, including looking at things under the microscope, little sections of each organ under the microscope. So that's the physical exam part. Then we'll look at the laboratory results. So that would be usually toxicology, but as I say, it could be blood cultures or um, <laughs> more recently, it's probably been a lot of COVID testing, uh, that kind of thing and then uh, look at the microscopic slides, and then put all of that together with the history, the terminal events, the physical findings, the laboratory findings, and then that's how the medical examiner reaches the conclusion about the cause and, and manner of death. So all of that goes into a death investigation? Yes. Do you sometimes interview people also as a part of it? Yes, the investigators who go to the scene may um, talk to family members. We certainly will talk to medical providers to get someone's past medical history. We often will interview or talk with law enforcement officers if they were the people who responded. It could be paramedics, EMS, uh, troopers, just depends on the case. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, a phrase uh, you use, terminal events. Yes. Uh, could you explain to the jury what is a terminal event? Sure. So when we're investigating a death as medical examiners, as I mentioned, we want to know as much as we can about this person leading up to their death because that often how they lived will provide us information about how they died. When I'm talking about terminal events, I'm talking about what happened in the period of time around their death, leading, shortly leading up to their death. So for example, he was out shoveling snow, he came in, clutched his chest, and fell over. That would be an example of a terminal event. Or we know someone was driving a car and went off the road. That would be what the terminal events were. Do you also rely on training and expertise on how injuries occur? Yes, as a forensic pathologist, that's one of the things we look at is and learn about is when we see this type of injury, we associate that with this type of event. What does the medical examiner then do at the conclusion of a death investigation? So the ultimate goal is to complete the information that's needed on the death certificate, um, specifically the cause and manner of death. Is a report generated? Yes. Uh, what's the nature of that report? Well, one of the main reports that's generated would be considered the autopsy report, and that's the report of the physical examination. Uh, but ultimately, the death certificate is kind of the final report. Now, you, you told us as a uh, forensic pathologist, you don't treat uh, living patients. Right. Uh, so if, uh, if we wanted to have a discussion, for example, about measuring lung volumes or <laughs> air reserves uh, in someone, well, that wouldn't be your bailiwick as a medical examiner. <laughs> that would not be me, no. Uh, By the time I see them, none of that applies, yes. Right. So, so Dr. Thomas, are you currently employed? 
Um, I work, uh, I'm kind of semi-retired. I do consulting and then I work part-time at medical examiner's offices in Reno, Nevada and Salt Lake City, Utah. Reno and Salt Lake City, Dr. Thomas? <laughs> there are places. I really like the way the office runs and um, I like still to be involved as a medical examiner. And pretty good places to hike. And good places to hike, yes. Uh, so what did you, where did you do your work before you were semi-retired? Um, right before I retired, I was at the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office as an assistant uh, medical examiner. And do you want me to go before that? Yes, or? if you could tell us your uh, work experience as a medical examiner forensic pathologist. Sure. Um, initially, I started after my training at the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office, working as a deputy and assistant, then assistant medical examiner, and I was there for many years. And then uh, in 1997, I joined the Minnesota Regional Medical Examiner's Office that was based in Hastings. And then I was chief of that office uh, for 13 years. And we were the medical examiner's office for eight counties in Minnesota, the largest of which were Dakota and Scott counties. And we also served as uh, an autopsy referral service and medical examiner's office for many other counties in Minnesota, as well as uh, Wisconsin and even one in Michigan. And uh, then, when our office outgrew that space, Dakota and Scott counties merged with Hennepin County, and that's why then I um, came back to Hennepin County. So over how many years have you performed uh, work or services as a forensic pathologist? Uh, let's see, 37 now, 36. And, and in Minnesota, how many counties? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I've been the direct medical examiner for eight counties. I've worked in offices that have been consultant to dozens of other counties. And uh, have you also performed those services in parts of Wisconsin? Yes. Uh, uh, when did you stop working at the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office? Um, it was uh, early 2017. Mm -hmm. I retired from Hennepin County. And how many autopsies would you estimate you have performed um, over your career? Um, probably about 5,000 that I myself did, and then um, hundreds, maybe a thousand more where I assisted someone else or I supervised or I participated in some way. So in 5,000 um, or so cases, you've determined the cause and manner of death? Well, actually way more than that because as medical examiners, uh, we don't just certify the cause and manner of death for the cases that we do autopsies on. There are numerous other cases that get reported by law to the medical examiner's office where we don't do a physical examination. So, for example, an elderly person falls in a nursing home and gets a hip fracture and then dies a couple months later, that death has to be reported to the medical examiner's office. We will investigate that death by looking at the medical records and doing all of what I talked about, getting family input and medical provider input, uh, but we generally will not do a physical examination, but still, by law, we have to sign the death certificate. So you're still determining then the cause and manner of death? Right, we're just not using and, and physical examination as part of it. And using the medical records primarily? Yes. Uh, Dr. Thomas, are you licensed presently? Yes, I'm licensed in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Tennessee, Nevada, and Utah. Do you also hold uh, any board certifications? Yes, I'm board certified by the American Board of Pathology in anatomic pathology, clinical pathology, and forensic pathology. Have you uh, worked with any professional organizations um, over the years related to forensic pathology? Um, yes, I've been a member of many different organizations, um, Minnesota Medical Association, American Medical Association, College of American Pathologists, 
um, American Academy of Forensic Sciences, and then I've been on the board of the Minnesota Coroners and Medical Examiners Association, oh, probably 30 plus years, and then um, I'm a member of the National Association of Medical Examiners, and I was on that board and a member of their executive committee for a number of years. And, and that goes by the acronym NAME, N-A-M-E? Yes. Um, what does NAME do? Um, well, they're the um, professional organization of medical legal death investigators, specifically forensic pathologists, medical examiners. And as um, an organization, they provide support to medical examiners, they provide information, they provide guidelines, um, an accreditation program, an inspection program, uh, lots of ways of assisting medical examiner offices. Dr. Thomas, have you done any teaching? Yes. Tell um, us about I, that. I have been a clinical instructor here at the University of Minnesota Department of Pathology. Uh, I've done lots of law enforcement training through the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension here in Minnesota, uh, as well as, oh my gosh, teaching everything from you know, middle school science students through high school and college and all kinds of professional uh, groups, whether it's other forensic pathologists, other law enforcement, um, you know, you name the organization that comes into contact with death investigation and I've probably talked to some of them at some point. Do you have any publications? That hasn't been a main focus of my career, but I uh, was I have several, and early on was involved in a, an autopsy protocol that was ultimately published by the United Nations that's still in use. So let's uh, switch topics and uh, talk about your uh, experience testifying in courts. Uh, have you testified before in a court? Yes, probably over a hundred times. And uh, is that uh, predominantly in your role as a medical examiner? It's um, mostly in my role as a medical examiner where I did the autopsy and then the prosecution would call me to testify as to my findings. Um, I've also testified as an expert witness consultant in cases where I didn't do the autopsy, but I was called by uh, maybe in a civil case, but either by the defense or the plaintiff, if they thought there was a wrongful death or um, some question about medical malpractice, something like that. And then I've also been consulted and testified in cases at the request of the defense. Again, not where I did the autopsy, but where I reviewed uh, someone else's work and then I consulted with the defense or testified. And uh, have you testified in Minnesota courts? Uh, Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, North Dakota, South Dakota, Pennsylvania. I think those are the ones. Mm -hmm. okay. So so Dr. Thomas, are you being paid for your time and services in this case? No. Uh, could you tell us uh, about that? Uh, how, how does it come about that you're not being paid for your time and services in this case? Um, well, I didn't ask to be paid. <laughs> And so did you uh, reach out to the state, or did the state reach out to you? <laughs> no, no, you reached out to me. And, um, you know, it just, I knew this was going to be important, and I felt like I had something to offer, and I wanted to do what I could to help explain what I think happened. Mm -hmm. So what were you asked to do then in this case? Well, I was asked to review a lot of the materials and come to an independent conclusion about what I thought the cause and manner of death were and the mechanism uh, for that cause. Could you uh, give the jurors a, a general sense or overview of the kinds of materials you reviewed? May I look at my notes? Yes, if you need to okay. refresh your recollection. Um, so I looked at the Hennepin County Medical Examiner materials including the autopsy report and toxicology and photographs and um, microscopic slides things like that. I looked at 
the Hennepin County Medical Center records, so Mr. Floyd's past medical history from there, as well as um, health partners' medical records. Then I looked at a lot of interviews, many, many videos, including um, body-worn camera videos, bystander videos, surveillance videos, um, some photographs, still photographs, timeline, um, and then some medical literature and textbooks. So were you the, uh, the medical examiner who investigated or did the autopsy around the death of George Floyd? No, that was the uh, Dr. Andrew Baker, the Hennepin County Medical Examiner. Uh, do you know Dr. Baker? I do. Um, he was a pathology resident when I was on staff at Hennepin County many years ago. And then um, when he did his fellowship, I was one of uh, the staff people there. And then after our offices merged, I worked again with him at Hennepin County. So would it, you have been uh, then part of his training in his early formative years? Yes. Right. Do you consider him a friend? I do, yes. Have you talked to him about this case? No, not since right after it happened. But you did review his report? Yes. And as well as Mr. Floyd's medical records? Yes. Uh, did you review the history of terminal events for May 25th, 2020? Yes. Uh, so and what, what was kind of unique, uh, what was absolutely unique in this case was the volume of materials I had to review. Um, I've never had a case like this that had such thorough documentation of the terminal events. And, and by way of the thorough documentation, uh, what makes it so thorough in your opinion? Well, uh, the use of videos is unique in this case. Certainly as medical examiners, we use videos, but there's never been a case that I've been involved with that had videos over such a long time frame and from so many different perspectives. Are you aware then of Dr. Baker's conclusions then on the manner of death? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, uh, I'd like to show Exhibit 193 that's been stipulated to subject to Dr. Baker's foundation. So first, uh, Dr. Thomas, what do we see here on Exhibit 193? Uh, this is a copy of the certificate of death of Mr. Floyd. Okay. And so, Brett, if we could uh, kind of highlight just through the, uh, the word underlying. Just to make it a little bigger to see. Okay. Uh, based on your review of the uh, of the evidence and the death certificate, do you agree with Dr. Uh, Baker's determination on the cause of death? Yes, I do. And is that by the word uh, immediate on here? Yes, cardiopulmonary arrest complicating law enforcement subdual restraint and neck compression. Have you, uh, Dr. Thomas, formed an opinion about the mechanism of death? Yes. Uh, would you tell us what that is? In this case, I believe the primary mechanism of death is asphyxia or low oxygen. So we'll come back to uh, the mechanism in, uh, in just a minute. Uh, can you explain to the jury what this cause of death means and why you agree with it? Well, it's kind of in two parts. So there's the cardiopulmonary arrest, which it doesn't provide a lot of additional clarifying information because in a way everyone dies of when your heart stops and your lungs stop, that's cardiopulmonary arrest. Um, but as a forensic pathologist, I would use cardiopulmonary arrest when I'm, to differentiate it from a cardiac arrest. So this is not a sudden cardiac death, a sudden cardiac arrhythmia. This is a death where both the heart and lungs stopped working. And the, the point is that it's due to law enforcement subdual restraint and compression. That is kind of what ultimately is the immediate cause of death is the subdual restraint and compression. And, and just so it's clear for the jurors, does cardiopulmonary arrest mean heart attack? No. Uh, does it mean 
fatal arrhythmia as a primary cause of death. No. Uh, it simply means that the heart stops and the lungs have stopped. Correct. It's another way of simply describing death itself. Right. Can you explain uh, what's referred to, looking here at the terms, uh, subdual restraint and neck compression? Um, those were activities by the law enforcement agency officers involved. Uh, subdual is subduing someone. Uh, trying to restrain them is, uh, in Mr. Floyd's case, involved uh, handcuffing him, uh, his positioning on the ground, the prone position, the people kneeling on him. And the neck compression is uh, the knee on the neck specifically. Um, additionally, there was some back and other uh, things being compressed by the officers. So if you put all this together, cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement subdual, restraint, and neck compression, what does that mean? Well, what it means to me is that the activities of the law enforcement officers resulted in Mr. Floyd's death, and that specifically those activities were the subdual, the restraint, and the uh, neck compression. And does this then also represent your own conclusion? Yes. Uh, a, a conclusion you have reached and an opinion you hold to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes. Uh, would you tell us what you reviewed in order to reach this conclusion? Um, all of those things that I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the, again, what's sort of unique about this case is that often um, I would just review the medical examiner case file and that would provide information about what the cause and manner of death is. Um, but in this case, the autopsy itself didn't tell me the cause and manner of death, and it really required getting all of this other additional information, specifically the video evidence of the terminal events, to conclude the cause of death and manner of death. When you make reference to something called the mechanism of death, yeah. would, would you tell us what mechanism of death means? So, cause of death is what's the thing, the disease or the pro injury or the process that caused someone's death. But the mechanism is kind of what was going on in the body at that time. So, for example, the cause of death might be a gunshot wound, but the mechanism of death might be blood loss related to that gunshot wound or... Um, you know, an infection that complicated that gunshot wound down the road, something like that. So it's more the what was actually happening at the body level that resulted in the cause of death. So, so focusing in on the mechanism of death here, uh, how is it that the officers of dual restraint and neck compression caused Mr. Floyd's death? So, as I mentioned, I think the primary mechanism was asphyxia or low oxygen. And it basically is Mr. Floyd was in a position, uh, because of the subdual restraint and compression, where he was unable to get enough oxygen in um, to maintain his body functions. What, what's required for normal breathing, Dr. Thomas? What is required? Yeah. Well, there are kind of three components. You have to be able to get air in, so you have to have a, what's called a patent airway, and that could be nose, mouth, you know, soft tissues of the neck, the larynx, the trachea, the larynx, oh, larynx, trachea, bronchi, all of that has to be open. Um, at the level of the lungs itself, there has to be adequate air exchange between oxygen coming in, carbon di dioxide going out. And then finally, the way the lungs work is it's kind of like a bellows that when you suck in air, your diaphragm drops and pulls air in. And then when you relax, the diaphragm collapses and pushes air out. So all three of those things have to be functioning in order to get adequate oxygen in. So for example, if someone is smothered, 
or strangled or they inhale a piece of hot dog or they have pneumonia such that their lungs are completely filled, then their airway is obstructed so that there isn't adequate air coming in, oxygen coming in. Or if someone is in an environment where there isn't enough oxygen, so for example, in a closed garage in which an old car has been running, there may be way high carbon monoxide. And in that case, they're perfectly able to breathe in and out, but there just isn't enough oxygen. And then the third would be if there's some kind of restriction such that your chest can't expand, your diaphragm can't expand, so the bellows function isn't working. And if any one of those components isn't working, then the, role, the result will be this mechanism of inadequate oxygen. Uh, doctor, how does narrowing of the hypopharynx fit into this? Well, the example I would give that people are probably most familiar with is sleep apnea or snoring. If um, you yourself or have a partner who snores, you know that especially in certain positions, the, um, what happens is the hypopharynx, which is sort of the soft tissues at the back of your throat, uh, will kind of collapse because there's inadequate air coming either forcing it out or forcing it in, which is why a CPAP machine works, because it forces air through that floppy area. Um, and if that collapses, then um, it makes it difficult to get air in. So Dr. Thomas, what do you, you rely on to reach your conclusion that low oxygen was the mechanism of death? Um, in this case, it was primarily the evidence from the terminal events, the video evidence, that um, show Mr. Floyd in a position where he was unable to adequately breathe. Mm -hmm. So how does the autopsy report itself uh, assist you or not? So the way the autopsy really helps is it's great for ruling things out. So in this case, the autopsy ruled out, for example, underlying lung disease. Mr. Floyd had had a history of COVID, but there was no evidence in his lungs at the time of his death that he had any lung disease that would impair his ability to breathe. And it ruled out injuries to the neck that suggest um, that his, uh, the bones in his neck had been broken, for example and it ruled out a stroke. He didn't have a stroke, so it wasn't like his blood pressure was so high that you know, he ruptured a vessel in his brain. He didn't have an aneurysm. He didn't have, or which is a ruptured vessel. He didn't have an embolism, which is a blood clot. He didn't rupture his heart. He didn't have an old heart attack or a recent heart attack or my, what's called myocardial infarct. So the autopsy is really great for ruling things out. Uh, Dr. Thomas, just to focus on one of those, uh, you said the autopsy ruled out a, a recent uh, myocardial infarction. Yes. Um, how does it do that? Well, it, when um, a forensic pathologist examines a heart, one of the things they look at is uh, the coronary arteries, which are the vessels that supply blood and nutrients to the heart muscle. And then the pathologist will examine the muscle of the heart. And if someone has had a, a recent heart attack, there may be evidence in the heart muscle of that damage. Or if they've had a prior and older heart attack, there will be scarring in the heart muscle that shows uh, that area of damage. Thank you, doctor. Uh, is it uh, normal as a part of your death investigation then to seek out and to look at the video? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, in, uh, in this case, um, is there any particular video footage that uh, struck you as more significant than others from what you saw? Oh, gosh, this case, there were so many. Um, the body-worn camera videos were very instructive because they started, well, and the cup foods video because they showed how Mr. Floyd was behaving long before law enforcement interaction. 
Then the body-worn cameras show the early interactions before there was any of this subdual restraint and compression. Um, and then they show the interactions during the uh, subdual restraint. Um, the bystander videos are really instructive, as well as the surveillance uh, videos from the scene at showing kind of during the time of the restraint. So there were lots, I would say. So in, in terms of the, uh, the video footage then either ruling in a cause or ruling out a cause, uh, how did it inform your, your assessments about the cause of death, having looked at the video? Well, it helped me rule in a cause and also rule out causes, I would say. Uh, so did it help you determine whether this was uh, what I might refer to as a lights out kind of death, a sudden death? Right. So what I observed from all of these videos is this was not a sudden death. Mr. Floyd did not it's not like the snow shoveling where I told you somebody comes in, collapses, and you know clutches their chest and falls over. This was n there was nothing sudden about his death. So that's what I would have expected if it was a cardiac arrhythmia or abnormal beating of the heart. Typically, those are someone really falls over pretty quickly, and this was not that. Um, likewise, it was not the type of death that has been reported in uh, fentanyl overdose, for example, where someone becomes very sleepy and then just sort of gradually, calmly, peacefully stops breathing. This was not that kind of a death. So I felt comfortable ruling out uh, those as causes of death. And then on the flip side, you, I could clearly see from watching the video what happens to Mr. Floyd during this subdual restraint and compression and what happens to his breathing is it gradually becomes more difficult and then stops. Uh, doctor, tell us what is the bellows function? Well, it's what your diaphragm does along with the muscles in between your ribs. So when you take in a deep breath, what's happening is your rib cage is expanding and that then forces the lungs to open up and that's what draws air in. So it's when someone is intubated in like surgery or something, it's sort of the opposite of that because your, your diaphragm is paralyzed and so somebody has to force air in. But under normal breathing circumstances, you just it's the bellows, it's the pulling air in. So what did the, the, the video tell you? What did you see in it uh, that had to do with the bellows function? Right, well, he, Mr. Floyd is in a position, so first of all, he's prone or sort of slightly with his head to the side, and he has his arms um, handcuffed behind his back. So that's um, already a bit of a difficult position to be in the um, prone and handcuffed. And then with, uh, at times, at least three officers on top of him, whether it's his neck or his back or his um, lower back or legs, um, it prevents him from moving his body into a position where he can adequately um, use the bellows function. And his chest is uh, sort of compressed in this position in such a way that he can't adequately expand and get enough oxygen in. Over what period of time was this? Nine minutes. So what did you see in, in those nine minutes uh, that led you to uh, conclude that the mechanism of death was low oxygen or asphyxia? Well, initially, uh, he, Mr. Floyd, is able to struggle pretty vigorously when he's in this position that uh, he recognizes as it's going to be hard for him to breathe in this position. Oh, so, Steve, that the last part of the answer about uh, Mr. Floyd's state of mind is stricken as speculative. Sorry. Um, so initially when he's in the prone position, um, he's breathing and speaking and 
um, it might look like, oh, he's at that point getting enough air exchange. Um, but over time, you can see that his breathing is getting more and more difficult and he's saying less and less. And then about halfway through the whole restraint, subdual compression process, he stops breathing. Well, he first stops speaking entirely. And then um, again, shortly after that, there's a movement that I believe is what's an, called an anoxic brain reaction, which is it looks like kind of a twitch. It's something that the body does when the brain no longer has enough oxygen. So that's the point at which um, you can tell by looking, oh, that's where he no longer is getting enough oxygen to his brain. And then uh, the restraint and subdual and compression continue for many minutes more, even after someone checks and says, oh, there's no pulse, they maintain um, the position. So at that point, his heart has also stopped. So he stopped breathing and his heart has stopped. So, so doctor, you, mix, you mentioned uh, an anoxic, A-N-O-X-I-C? Yes. Anoxic brain reaction? Yes. Is that also known as an anoxic seizure? Yes. Uh, is that something that a uh, person does consciously and voluntarily? Oh, no. No, it's something that your body just does when your brain doesn't have enough oxygen. It's why in lots of cases, people who are witnessing someone die will say, oh, they had a seizure and died. Well, no, what's actually happened is they're, they've basically died. Their brain doesn't have enough oxygen, and then they had this muscle twitch that may look like a, a seizure. So can we uh, go back to Exhibit 193, and I want to ask you about, uh, that's right in front of you, the other contributing conditions, if we could highlight that. Uh, Brian. So do you see where I'm referring to uh, the other contributing conditions? Yes. Uh, and what are those? In this case, they are arteriosclerotic and hypertensive heart disease, fentanyl intoxication, and recent methamphetamine use. So would you explain for the jury, what does it mean, uh, other contributing conditions? So the way uh, forensic pathologists and medical examiners usually use this is people often think of it, the death certificate is for that person, that specific person who died and their family. And that's true. It does serve a very useful purpose for life insurance, whatever. But forensic pathologists are also using death certificates for public health data purposes. And so in any given case, we aren't just thinking about <clears throat> this particular person and their cause and manner of death. We're also thinking the, the state and the federal government collect data on why do people die? What is cause of death? It's how we know as a country that we have, uh, you know, um, how many people die of COVID, for example. It's because death certificates list that. So one of the things that we use this other contributing conditions for is to list disease processes or drugs that are present at the time of death but that we don't directly, that we don't believe directly contributed to the cause of death. But it's so that someone looking at data years from now can say, okay, we want to do a, an evaluation of all deaths during law enforcement subdual. And how many of those deaths involved someone who also had drugs on board? Because that may be something that is relevant then in trying to prevent these sort of deaths in the future, for example. Or the case where I use other contributing conditions probably the most is the hip fracture case that I talked about before, where someone dies of a hip fracture due to a fall, but they're 84 years old and they also have hypertensive heart disease, arteriosclerotic heart disease, 
asthma, diabetes. And so I will list those as other contributing conditions. Now, in no way did those things cause the fall and the hip fracture and the resulting whatever pneumonia or whatever. Um, but again, someone from a data perspective might want to know, you know, of the 84-year-old women who die of hip fractures, what percentage of them have underlying heart disease? Because again, from a data collection standpoint, does that provide useful public health information that can be used in the future to try and prevent these deaths? So that's how I would view this. It's very long-winded, sorry. Sure, no, no, Dr. Thomas. So in understanding this is uh, further, so other contributing conditions are conditions that may have contributed but were not the direct cause of the death. Exactly. Uh, did you consider these other contributing conditions in your assessment of the cause and mechanism of death for George Floyd? Yes. And uh, what? how did you consider them, first of all? Well, I wanted to look at each one as and ask the question, is this the cause of his death? Uh, is arteriosclerotic heart disease the cause of his death? He has narrowing of his coronary arteries. In many cases, that is the cause of someone's death. So I looked at that, but again, it comes down to what were the history of the terminal events? Does this look like the type of death we see, or is, you know, I'm not a clinician, so I don't see it, but as a forensic pathologist, I know from hundreds of families describing what happened at the time of death that this death does not fit what has been described in someone who dies of a cardiac arrhythmia from arteriosclerotic heart disease. And likewise, hypertensive heart disease. Those tend to be cardiac arrhythmias, sudden cardiac deaths. This is not that kind of death. Likewise, fentanyl intoxication, as I described, uh, and again, I don't treat patients, I don't see living people, but what I know from family members who describe deaths that then later turn out to be due to fentanyl, the death is slow, it's peaceful, they fall asleep, they may hear snoring or very heavy deep breathing. There's no struggle. They just often are found just kind of slumped over. It's a very um, slow death. So again, totally different than what is seen in Mr. Floyd's death. Methamphetamine as a cause of death generally is, again, much more of a sudden death. It may cause a cardiac arrhythmia. It may cause a seizure, and by that I don't just mean this sort of terminal anoxic twitch, but like a full-blown um, seizure. And again, looking from what I know about Mr. Floyd's death, because it's so well documented, that does not fit with the, uh, a methamphetamine death. So you reviewed the toxicology? Yes, oh yes. How would you characterize the amount of meth in Mr. Floyd's system? At the time? Well, it was there. Uh, it's not particularly high. Uh, certainly in deaths that I have attributed to methamphetamine, it's been much higher. Uh, but it's not like there's any safe level of methamphetamine, but this was a very low level. So was the methamphetamine uh, significant in your assessment of the cause of death? No. So then based on your uh, view, review of the video and application of your work experience and knowledge, uh, did you rule out uh, drug overdose uh, as a uh, cause of death? Yes. And that's an opinion you hold to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes. Now, let, I, th I wanted to clarify this early and just forgot to. Does the medical examiner also complete the death certificate? Yes, we don't issue it. That comes from the county or state. Um, but as a medical examiner, we fill out all of the cause and manner and how injury occurred and all that kind of stuff. How many death certificates have you filled out? Oh, gosh, well, um, thousands and thousands. So if we look here again at the exhibit in front of you, uh, 193, uh, in the left margin, uh, we see a reference uh, here to underlying. 
Yes. Uh, would you tell the jurors what that means? Sure. So uh, let's go back to that hip fracture because I keep referring to that. But for example, uh, someone who dies of a hip fracture, generally that's not a sudden death. What happens is someone gets a hip fracture, they get it surgically repaired, they uh, may get pneumonia or something like that. So then, in that kind of case, we would list the immediate cause of death as pneumonia. The underlying cause of that is the hip fracture that was operated, but the underlying cause of the hip fracture was the fall. They fell, they got a hip fracture, they got pneumonia. So it's something that um, is used when you have a death that has maybe multiple sequences of events. But in a case like this, you don't need an underlying because it's all included in the first line. It's all due to the law enforcement subdual restraint and neck compression. Now, the, the death certificate uh, does not use the word asphyxia or any reference to low oxygen. No. Uh, would you have used the word asphyxia in this case? Probably not. I tend not to use the word asphyxia much because um, it requires a lot of explanation. It doesn't really offer much additional information unless you have a chance to have a discussion like we've had about what asphyxia means. So I tend to just list, you know, if someone dies of hanging, well, that's a type of asphyxial death, but I wouldn't say necessarily asphyxia due to hanging, I would probably just list hanging as the cause of death. So to refer to asphyxia or low oxygen doesn't tell you anything about why there is asphyxia or low oxygen. Right. Um, are the findings on autopsy uh, that uh, suggest low oxygen as a cause of death? No, there's nothing on autopsy that shows low oxygen. Uh, there's no test that could be done for low oxygen on autopsy? No. Mm -hmm. Are there uh, physical findings that uh, sometimes may be found and may be consistent with uh, low oxygen? So there are no physical findings that show low oxygen, but there may be physical findings that sh are consistent with a cause of death that may result in low oxygen. So um, for example, the hanging, let's use that hanging. If someone is partially hanged, uh, by that I mean they, they are only partially suspended, so there's only some pressure on their neck, they may have what are called petechiae or little pinpoint hemorrhages in the eyes because blood is still going into their head but not able to drain out because of the pressure on the neck. So at autopsy, we will see the petechiae and we can say, based on the scene investigation and the history, that finding is consistent with hanging, which the mechanism for hanging is a type of asphyxia. Or in manual strangulation, we might see some bruising or we might see broken bones in the neck. And the mechanism of death in strangulation is low oxygen, but the finding that we are seeing is consistent with strangulation. So it's kind of a fine line between saying it isn't the low oxygen that we see at autopsy, but sometimes, not always, but sometimes in cases where the death is the result of low oxygen, we see specific findings related to the cause. So if you then see petechiae, it could help to lead you to the conclusion that it was death by low oxygen. Yes. But if you don't see petechiae, what can you conclude? Uh, nothing. So it's one of those things um, that when it's present, if there's petechiae or broken bones in the neck or bruising, that's very helpful in putting together a picture of what might have happened. But if you don't have them, it doesn't help you one way or the other. And by not help you one way or the other, it means you can't uh, conclude from that alone that a person did or did not die of low oxygen. Exactly. Right. And you mentioned bruising in that context. Right. And again, sometimes 
I mean, for example, strangulation is a great example. Sometimes in strangulation, you have all kinds of bruises that you can see on the neck, but other times there's a strangulation case and they don't have a single mark on their neck. And I mean, there's all kinds of reasons that bruises may or may not occur, but it's, again, it's one of those things, if it's there, it's very helpful. If it's not, it's not helpful. Were there other findings in the, the death investigation that supported your conclusion on the cause and mechanism of George Floyd's death? Yes. Uh, would you tell us what those were? So Mr. Floyd had superficial injuries, what would be described as superficial injuries, uh, specifically on his face, on his shoulders, on his wrists. And what that does is it supports what I saw in the videos, which is that he's being forcibly restrained and subdued, and he's um, trying to move into a position uh, by rubbing his face against the concrete cement of the, the ground, um, by pulling against his handcuffs. You can see the injury to his wrists from the handcuffs, um, and by pushing with his shoulder. Um, and he also had some scrapes on his knuckles on his right hand, and again, that was from him pushing to try and get into a position where he could breathe. Uh, Dr. Thomas, are there photographs that depict what you're describing? Oh, yes, thank you. So, Your Honor, we've uh, stipulated by way of foundation to the photos, we have individual packets uh, for the jurors. There was in the jury, uh, there are some stipulated photographs that are going to be shown to you, or as we call, as you've heard me say, published to you. Uh, we're going to go old school this time. We're not going to put everything on the monitors. Uh, we're not going to broadcast it out. But everybody in the courtroom will have access to it, including yourselves. Uh, essentially, a packet with these photographs. We'll collect them afterwards because these are for you to use in the courtroom. The actual exhibit will be available in deliberation, however. Mr. Blackwell? Yeah, would you either like the deputy or someone distribute these, or should I? Uh, you can go ahead, Mr. Blackwell. but don't start looking through them until uh, Mr. Blackwell resumes his examination. Mr. Blackwell, Mr. Schaefer will take care of the rest. Well, let's make sure everybody who would like a copy gets one. Spectators. Spectators should get, each get a copy if they want one. You'll have to give up one of your copies. There you go. Mr. Your Blackwell? Your Honor, if I may, I think I'll give one to Dr. Thomas just so she has it. Actually, she can have mine. Oh. That way, Your Honor won't have to use the camera at all. So, Dr. Thomas. If we start with the exhibit that's marked 185. Yes. 
see it on my screen. Uh, Dr. Thomas, looking at Exhibit 185, what is significant in this photograph uh, that informs your conclusions pertaining to the restraint and subdual as a cause of Mr. Floyd's death? This is a photograph of Mr. Floyd's uh, face, and it shows some facial injuries, most notably the what are called abrasions, which are scrapes over his left eyebrow and over his left cheek. You can also see there's littler uh, scrapes or small cuts on his nose and lip, uh, upper lip, and then a little on the left side of his lower lip. But the main thing this shows is that the left side of his face was obviously in contact with some rough surface. Dr. Thomas, if we look at Exhibit 235, uh, it uh, may be a close-up of the same area. Sorry, here we go. Yes, yes, that is a, a, a close up of the left cheek and the left forehead. And you can see, for example, above the left eyebrow, there's uh, a dark area that's a, a dried scrape, as well as there's a little bit of discoloration of the skin, so that also there was a bruise there. And then on his left cheek, you can see the dark area as well as kind of a lighter orange uh, pink area and those are again scrapes. The dark area is where a scrape has dried. And what does that tell you about the, uh, the cause or mechanism of his death? It's uh, consistent with the impression from watching the video that his face was on the ground and he was moving his face in an effort to get into a position where he could breathe. Uh, let's look at Exhibit 188. This is a photograph of Mr. Uh, Floyd's left shoulder. And what, what do we see here? This again is an area of scrapes and indicates that there was some force uh, between his shoulder and some rough surface, in this case the ground. And again is consistent with what it looks like on the video that he's struggling to push himself into a position where he can breathe. Right. Let's look at Exhibit 187. This is a photograph of his right shoulder, and again, uh, you can see there's a little bit of discoloration, and then the skin is scraped. So there's less injury impact here, and that fits with, again, what you see in the video of which side was down and um, which side had more contact with the ground. Let's look at Exhibit 189. This is a photograph of Mr. Floyd's left hand, and if you look at the uh, base of his hand, sort of right over his wrist, you can see there's some areas of red uh, discoloration with kind of a pale area in between and that's uh, consistent with handcuff marks. You can also see on the um, sort of outer edge, there's some white material that's dried skin, and that's an area where his skin has actually been rubbed up from the handcuffs. And Dr. Exhibit 190? Um, exhibit 190 is a photograph of his right hand and wrist, and again, in this case, you can see more clearly the sort of the double-lined um, discoloration 
above his right wrist that's consistent with the handcuff marks and indicates uh, pressure against handcuffs. And again, on the outer edge, you can see there's a little bit where it's darker and then there's some white skin. So that's an area where it's actually been scraped. The skin has actually been scraped uh, by the handcuffs. Also on this photograph, you can see on the knuckles of his um, index finger and middle finger, there's uh, some skin that is scraped off. And that's consistent with what you can see on the video where he's pushing against, um, I think it's the, the rim of the car tire or something, um, to try and push his body into a position again where he can um, breathe. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Uh, Your Honor, the jurors may put the photographs away if they like. Uh, not the actual exhibits, they're simply uh, for your use during this time. And we'll ask the spectators also to return the exhibits. You can keep yours. Council can keep theirs. Thank you, Your Honor. So, so Dr. Thomas, having looked at this uh, physical evidence uh, from the autopsy, was that evidence in of and by itself conclusive? No. Uh, there are multiple ways that scrapes and bruises can happen. Uh, it's only useful in the context of what is seen in the videos. Was there any evidence to suggest that Mr. Floyd was suffering from a uh, potentially fatal condition on the evening of May 25th, 2020? No. Uh, do you uh, have an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty if Mr. Floyd would have died that night had he not been subject to the uh, subdual and restraint of the police? There's no evidence to suggest he would have died that night, except for the interactions with law enforcement. Now, were there, were there other mechanisms that you felt uh, contributed to Mr. Floyd's death? Yes. Uh, could you generally characterize what those were? Sure, so I think a secondary mechanism in this case is what I refer to as physiologic stress. And by that, I don't mean like the stress, oh, somebody's a type A personality and they have a deadline at work and they're just really stressed about it. I'm not talking about that kind of stress. I'm talking about the kind of physical stress you feel when you're driving along and all of a sudden a car swerves right in front of you and you slam on the brakes and you realize, oh my gosh, if that had if I hadn't reacted, if that had happened a second earlier, I would have been in a potentially fatal car crash. And you can feel your heart race and you kind of, you're, you know, and then the car speeds on and you slow down and you realize I'm okay, everybody in the car is okay, and you know, your heart rate then slows and you, or I think even worse, you're at the beach and you suddenly realize my toddler. I haven't seen my toddler in, um, oh my gosh, where's my toddler? And that just, that rush of adrenaline you get and you feel flushed and you get goosebumps and your heart races and you feel short of breath and, and then there they are, they're getting an ice cream cone and you go, oh, okay. But it takes you a minute for your heart to kind of slow down and your blood pressure to slow down and you to be able to take a deep breath and recover yourself. So that's the kind of physiologic stress I'm talking about, only instead of after a, a second or a minute, this goes on for minute after minute after minute for nine minutes where you, you are terrified um, and you can't, there's no recovery 
So it's that kind of fear of life that I'm talking about for physiologic stress. Are, are you able to tell us uh, what uh, is going on in the body during the physiologic stress? So it's um, the reactions are you get chemical release, you get adrenaline, noradrenaline, or epinephrine, norepinephrine, and those are things that make your heart race, your blood pressure go up, you uh, require more, uh, your muscles get ready to act, to go run, to do whatever you need to do, slam on the brakes, and so you start um, needing more oxygen in your muscles, you need to take more breaths, uh, you, you're, you need more oxygen for your heart rate uh, because your heart's beating faster. There may be other chemicals that are released, whether it's uh, you know stress hormones or cortisol or things like that. Um, there may be um, uh, lactic acid that's produced as your muscles, you know, when you have a heavy workout, uh, your muscles get tired and kind of sore. It's because there's been an increase in lactic acid and it's your muscles working. Uh, so all of those physical things, uh, those chemical things, can cause reactions in the body that put additional stress uh, primarily on your heart, but also on all of your body systems because your body requires your chemistry to be in very fine balance. And when there's too much, say, lactic acid or too much, um, not enough, you know, not an ability to compensate for that elevated lactic acid, um, then all of your body organs will get into trouble. Uh, doctor, do you consider that phys physiological stress that you're describing a direct cause or mechanism of death, or is it secondary? Well, it, it can. I guess I would consider it a contributory, contributory cause or contributory to the cause of death. Um, it's it's a, another contributing mechanism. And so the direct cause is what, and then the secondary cause is what? So the, the their sort of primary mechanism, I think, is asphyxia and the secondary, or low oxygen, and the secondary mechanism is this physiologic stress. But ultimately, the cause of death is the subdual restraint and compression. So this physiologic uh, stress or physiological stress uh, that we're discussing, is that something that can be observed on autopsy? No. Uh, and and why, why is that? Well, it's a chemical reaction. It's uh, increased heart rate, which of course we don't see at autopsy. It's increased um, chemicals that we don't can't test for at autopsy so it none of it is anything that can be seen physically so it's a functional mechanism yes yes that's a good way of describing it. is uh, low oxygen then also a functional mechanism yes So could you tell us how you felt that the physiological stress was significant uh, to your conclusion on the cause of Mr. Floyd's death? So Mr. Floyd was already in a position where he was experiencing difficulty breathing and getting enough oxygen in his body. And on top of that now, there's this physiologic stress that's putting increased demand on his heart increased demand on his lungs, increased demand on his muscles. So all of the things that he's using, his muscles, his um, strength, his body, to try and get himself into a safe position where he can breathe, those are being doubly stressed by the position that he's in as well as the underlying um, chemical reactions that are going on in his body. So it's kind of a double whammy to his heart and lungs and muscles and his whole system. Okay. So Dr. Thomas, I want to show you um, Exhibit 194. Uh, again, Your Honor, that's been stipulated to subject to foundation uh, later. Uh, 
First, uh, Dr. Thomas, can you tell us what this is? Um, this is a press release that was put out by the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office at the time they certified the cause and manner of death of Mr. Floyd. And is it your understanding that the Medical Examiner's Office generates uh, this type of a press release report in certain cases? Yes. So there is a section in the press release report that refers to manner of death? Yes. Let's see if we can highlight that. And we see the word there, um, homicide. Yes. And we, saw, we see also in here uh, information we saw on the, on the death certificate uh, where the press release says also how the injury occurred. Yes. And would you read that for the record? How injury occurred, decedent experienced a cardiopulmonary arrest while being restrained by law enforcement officers. Again, you agree with that? Yes. Uh, so let me show you uh, what uh, was marked as Exhibit 918. And homicide is a manner of death. Isn't yes. It? And, uh, and uh, would you explain to the jurors a little bit about what it is medical examiners look to when they're trying to determine manner of death? Sure. So unlike cause of death, which could be anything, uh, we only have five options for manner of death. So a death can be natural, meaning that all of the conditions that contribute to the death are due to just innate processes. Could be cancer, could be heart disease, something like that. Second category is an accident, and that would be something like a motor vehicle crash or an unintended drug overdose. Third category is a suicide, which is death at one's own hands, uh, with at least probably some element of intent. Uh, the fourth category is homicide, and that means death at the hands of another. And then the fifth category is undetermined, and that means generally we don't have enough information about this type of death to make a determination to fit it into one of the other categories. So for example, we talked a lot about terminal events early on. And in some cases, we have no idea what the terminal events were because the person is just found dead in their residence. And we don't know because they've been alienated from family. We don't know were they saying they were going to take their lives? Did they have a prolonged, did they, history of using drugs? Did they just get out of prison? You know, we're unable to get enough information to sort it into, was this an accidental death or was this an intentional suicide death? And so that would be an example where we might use undetermined, where we just don't have enough information. So Dr. Thomas, if you uh, looked in at the, the screen in front of you, does this uh, depict to show the manners of death? Exactly. And uh, homicide is highlighted reflecting what Dr. Baker found. Yes. And, uh, and do you agree with that finding? Yes. In the case of George Floyd. Uh, Your Honor, we offer uh, Exhibit 918. Any objection? And the exhibit itself is without the highlight, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Nine eighteen is received. For the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, these are the five manners of death that you were describing, Dr. Thomas? Yes. And we've highlighted uh, homicide to reflect what uh, Dr. Baker found and that you agree with. Yes. Um, is there any uh, guidance given to medical examiners about how to select homicide as a manner of death? Yes. And there uh, is a guide that was published by the National Association of Medical Examiners that provides um, assistance in how to make a determination between these different. I want to show you uh, what's been marked as Exhibit 952. 
you see that, Dr. Thompson? Yes, yes. And uh, is this the, uh, the publication that provides the guidance to medical examiners on how to determine manner of death? Yes. Would reference to uh, excerpts from this guide be helpful to your testimony? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, we offer uh, excerpts from Exhibit uh, 952. Any objection? Uh, yeah, can I do an objection? All right. Actually, uh, would this be a good time to break so we can deal with the sidebar issue as well? All right, members of the jury, we'll take our 20-minute. Uh, We're probably going to have some work here, so let's come back around uh, 5 after, 11.05. this particular uh, exhibit. I don't think it's appropriate for this to be admitted as an actual exhibit because it contains a medical definition of what constitutes homicide. Uh, the jury, it's within the province of the jury in terms of the jury instructions that are ultimately provided to them to determine the legal definition of, of um, what, what, of this case. Um, so in this particular instance, I think it, it would confuse the jury between the medical definition and the legal definition, I don't think it's appropriate for this to be admitted. Well, I can't see the whole exhibit in any case. Uh, all I see is the title page. Can you uh, click to the main next screen? Can you see that, Jerome? All right, hold on. Do you have any objection to this being shown as a demonstrative? I don't have it as being a demonstrative, but going back to the jury as an actual exhibit. That's fine. Uh, I'll receive 952 as demonstrative, so you can show it to the jury and have them follow along and have Dr. Thomas. Uh, I figured at some point you're going to do that with her or Dr. Baker. Yes. So that's fine. Okay, as a demonstrative, it is received. All right, uh, five after, please. 
that was just a reminder, you're still under oath. Thank you. Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Thomas, I want to briefly go back to Exhibit 918 uh, that we discussed, and then we're going to resume our discussion on, uh, on homicide after that. Uh, just to clarify for the jurors, jurors what these various classifications are, um, if we talk about natural, you discussed that with us. As yes. An example of a natural manner of death would be, for example, a heart attack. Yes. Um, if we talk about uh, an accidental cause of do uh, death, where would uh, drug overdose fit in general as a cause of death? Usually drug overdoses are accidental unless there's evidence of intent, in which case it would be suicidal. So we know what uh, suicide is? Yes. And, uh, and undetermined, if the medical examiner can't tell which of these it is or what it is, then and undetermined is what you would indicate. Exactly. Uh, so if uh, the manner of death here has been determined to be homicide, uh, does that, in your opinion as a medical examiner, rule out a death by accidental drug overdose? Yes. Now, Brett, let's go back to, to Exhibit 952. That's admitted for demonstrative purposes. So, Doctor, we were talking about the uh, designation of, of homicide. Yes. And, uh, and tell us what this guide is as, as relates to how we define homicide as medical examiners. Um, homicide is defined in its most broad sense as death at the hands of another. And it goes into more detail if we want to look at that. So if, uh, but, but this is uh, guidance given from the National Association of Medical Examiners to medical examiners. Exactly. And it provides guidance and guidelines on how to designate a matter of death as homicide. Yes. So Brett, if we could go to the next slide. So doctor, um, could you read this in uh, for the record? Homicide occurs when death results from a volitional act committed by another person cause fear, harm, or death. Intent to cause death is a common element, but is not required for classification as homicide, more below. It is to be emphasized that the classification of homicide for the purposes of death certification is a neutral term and neither indicates nor implies criminal intent, which remains a determination within the province of legal processes. And you agree with this? Absolutely. It's a guideline you follow? Yes. And uh, have you followed uh, this kind of a guideline for uh, the years you've been a medical examiner? Yes. Uh, is there more uh, guidance given from the National Association of Medical Examiner guidelines on what constitutes voluntary acts? Yes. Uh, if you could click one more time. And so Dr. Thomas, could you read this for us? In general, if a person's death results at the hands of another who committed a harmful volitional act directed at the victim, the death may be considered a homicide from the death investigation standpoint. And then, although there may not have been intent to kill the victim, the victim died because of the harmful intentional volitional act committed by another person. Thus, the manner of death may be classified as homicide because of the intentional or volitional act, not because there was an intent to kill. And when you uh, agree with the conclusion that Dr. Baker reached of homicide, is this the definition of homicide that you're applying that we saw in these two slides? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Tom. Now I want to ask you uh, about a new subject, and this has to do with uh, certain studies mm -hmm. that assess whether the prone restraint uh, is dangerous from a breathing uh, point of view. And I'd like to get your perspective as a forensic pathologist and a medical examiner in this respect. Um, are you aware of any such studies? Yes. Uh, do you agree generally with the research uh, that, that comes to a conclusion that the prone restraint uh, is not dangerous for respiration? In certain laboratory 
safe settings, that may be true, but I do not agree with their applicability to real life situations. If, if you could generally characterize for the jurors, what's the punchline of these studies? What do they show? Well, they purport to show that putting someone in a prone position, even with some restraint and with weight on their back is perfectly safe. And uh, do you find the studies to be reliable or do you find them controversial? Well, I think they are fine for laboratory purposes, but they bear no resemblance to real world situations. So I would say they're irrelevant for purposes of what we're talking about here. And so how do they uh, then not relate to the real world? What's artificial about them? Well, I would say for starters, these are volunteers who have agreed to be put in this dangerous position of a prone restraint. But they know perfectly well at any point if they feel scared or uncomfortable, all they have to do is say, stop. And that has happened in some of these studies that a couple of the volunteers have said, wait, no, I can't tolerate being in this position. It's too scary. So that, to me, immediately takes out that whole element that we were talking about, about the terror, the physiologic stress. So that's number one. Number two is they are healthy volunteers. These are young people who have mostly young people, mostly healthy, who have agreed to be part of this study. So it doesn't relate to someone who may have other underlying factors that um, may contribute. Thirdly, there's, um, they're put on a, uh, like a gymnastics mat to be face down. So it's completely different when you're squished between a person and a hard ground versus having a evenly distributed weight on your back and you're on a, a mat. Um, third, none of, the, or fourth, I guess, um, and perhaps most significantly here, uh, none of them went on and on and on beyond the point where the person stopped breathing and where their heart stopped. So they were being monitored the whole time and if at any point they had had significant respiratory or cardiac difficulties, the study would have stopped and the person volunteering knew that. So it, to me, it just, it bears no resemblance to what Mr. Floyd experienced. Did any of the studies involve a knee on the neck of any of the volunteers? No. Uh, any of them go on for as long as nine minutes and 29 seconds? No. Uh, do you know if uh, any of the studies actually measured the decrease in lung volumes uh, as part of the study, that is, decrease in oxygen reserves? Uh, not that I know of, no. So any relevance to George Floyd at all? Uh, not in my opinion, no. Dr. Thomas, have you uh, done any calculations or kind of work of your own uh, to measure what the subdual and the restraint with the knee on the neck and the back of George Floyd uh, would have done to his oxygen reserves or lung uh, capacities? No, that would be something I would completely defer to a pulmonary doctor to address. So then are you able to tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury if you uh, haven't done that work, whether the forces that Mr. Floyd was subjected to would have even killed a normal, healthy person? In the way you phrased that, uh, not based on lung volume and that kind of study, I mean, from watching the video, I certainly wouldn't want to be in that position, but that's a different answer. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. No further questions. Mr. Nelson. Good morning, Dr. Thomas. Good morning. How are you today? Good, thank Good. you. Nice to see you. Um, 
<clears throat> you described being a forensic pathologist as sort of being the doctor's doctor, right? A uh, general pathologist is considered that, yes. Right, and the forensic pathologist in terms of a death investigation, you, you kind of have to wear many hats, right? Yes. You have to have a broad familiarity with, the, with multiple medical conditions, right? Yes. And sometimes medical conditions may appear at autopsy that you've never seen before. Yes. <laughs> right? Uh, some strange disease that you've never seen, right? Yes. And you have to, you will speak to other doctors, right? Yes. You will gather information and um, share that. They'll share information with you to help you conclude, uh, make conclusions in an autopsy, right? Yes. And you also described how being a medical examiner is, is more than just the autopsy, right? Yes. The autopsy is one small part of a uh, death investigation, right? Yes. You described um, reviewing uh, videotapes in certain circumstances, right? Yes. Um, past medical records, right? Yes. Interviews with friends, family members, people who were uh, who knew the decedent, right? Yes. And ultimately, um, the medical examiner's office compiles a massive, you know, amount of information itself about the cause and manner of death, right? Yes. And you've had an opportunity to review uh, a lot of that information in this case, correct? Yes. Now, have you reviewed all of the interviews of witnesses? Probably not all of them, no. Okay. Have you, um, after you prepared your report, have you been provided with additional materials that may be relevant to your uh, considerations? Um, not that I can think of off the top of my head. Okay. Um, and we'll come back to that. So I just kind of want to, but you, you did have an opportunity to review Dr. Baker's entire file. Right? Yes. And um, I believe we'll be hearing from Dr. Baker later this morning or this afternoon, but and we'll have some questions for him. I would like to follow up on some of your conclusions. There's a term used in Dr. Baker's uh, autopsy, the, the cause of death, the term complicating. Yes. Can you define, medically speaking, what the term complicating means? Oh, I guess it could be used in lots of different ways. Um, The way I would think of it in this setting is both things were present, that there was a cardiopulmonary arrest and that it was due to law enforcement, subdual restraint and um, compression. Okay. I guess that's how I would consider it in this setting. Have you been provided with Dr. Baker's, any information about Dr. Baker's opinions in this case? Uh, nothing very specific. I mean, just what he put in the autopsy report and all of his conclusions. Right. So, in terms of in terms of the word "complicating," um, it's capable of different definitions based upon the forensic pathologist, right? Yes. Right. And so, you, as a forensic pathologist, may have a different interpretation of what um, "complicating" means compared to Dr. Baker, for example. Yes. And um, the, there's a, a reasonable degree of disagreement amongst, um, in any case generally, it's reasonable for doctors to disagree with each other, is it not? That sometimes happens, yes. Um, all right. You did not perform the actual autopsy of Mr. Floyd, correct? Correct. And uh, that was Dr. Baker who did that, right? Yes. And you know Dr. Baker well? Yes. And you know him to be a competent uh, medical examiner? Yes. He's the chief medical examiner for Hennepin County at this time? Yes. Now, 
you were provided again with inf all of the information from his report, and I would like to go through a few of the things with you. Um, let's talk about Mr. Floyd's heart first. Okay. okay. Um, what was the size of Mr. Floyd's heart as measured at autopsy? The uh, weight of Mr. Floyd's heart was 540 grams. And would you explain or would you describe that as an enlarged heart? I would say it's a slightly enlarged heart, yes. Okay. And there are some different measures of how to base an enlarged heart or how to determine if a heart is enlarged, right? Right. Some, by some categories, that heart would not be considered enlarged. So there's two, as I understand it, two different kind of primary measurements um, or primary ways of comparing Mr. Floyd's heart to determine if it's enlarged, right? The Molina studies and the Northwestern studies. Oh, oh, I see. Um, oh, there's probably multiple ways of looking at uh, heart weights. I mean, those are two of them. There's the study from the Mayo Clinic. There's one in Europe. Um, yeah, there's lots of ways of analyzing. But ultimately, based on all of your information, you would agree that Mr. Floyd's heart was slightly enlarged, right? Yes. In terms of the DeMaio and Molina standard, uh, what would a normal male heart weight weigh for a person similar to Mr. Floyd? Oh, I don't know off the top of my head. Would you disagree if I said it was 383 grams? That well could be. Okay. For the average, I mean. For the average, right. Yeah. So according to, if that were the average heart rate, or heart size, excuse me, heart weight, 383 grams, relevant to Mr. Floyd's heart, Mr. Floyd's heart would be considered profoundly enlarged. Well, the thing about using averages in um, especially medicine, which is of course what I'm most familiar with, is we don't generally say, we don't generally just compare it to an average, we usually compare it to an average plus or minus two standard deviations. So that's why the range that um, I usually use is, you know, from 253 to 510 grams would be the range of normal for someone of Mr. Floyd's height. Um, and so I don't know in the DeMaio uh, Molina study what their two standard deviations would be. Okay. But I, I, I wouldn't use just the average. Okay, and so in, in terms of your, how you would assess the weight or size of the heart, um, you would say 510 is grams is the high, 510 grams is the high end? Right. Right. Of, of that and 540 is exceeds that right right and so in terms of a whether it's a, a very enlarged heart or even a relatively minimally enlarged heart a larger heart requires more blood right yes it has greater demand yes what are some of the things that cause a person to have an enlarged heart probably the primary cause is high blood pressure you understand, based on Mr. Floyd's medical records, that he did, in fact, have a history of high blood pressure, correct? Yes. Can you describe the uh, blood vessels of the heart? There are several major coronary arteries that, as I mentioned, uh, supply blood and nutrients to the heart muscle. Uh, there's the left and right and then the left branches into the left anterior descending and the left circumflex, and then there's some other branches off that. And how would you describe narrowing or stenosis of the coronary arteries? So the way we as forensic pathologists describe it is we look at the opening. So if an opening is fully open, then that would be 0% narrowing. And if it's completely closed, then that would be 100% occluded. And so then we look at anything ranging from, you know, 25, 50, 75, 90%. Obviously, it's just an eyeball estimation. We don't actually get out calipers and measure because the actual percentage doesn't really matter. It's more a, did they have coronary artery disease? Was it pretty good, pretty bad? 
um, that sort of thing. Um, can you describe the difference between proximal and distal narrowing? Um, w w the way the coronary arteries supply blood to the heart, they come off of the aorta, which is the main vessel that takes blood from the heart to the rest of the body. And so in close to the aorta is called proximal to the aorta. And then the further out it goes, distributing blood along the way to the heart muscle is called distal. And when you have proximal uh, narrowing, how does that affect the heart? It can narrow the blood supply to more of the heart than if you have distal narrowing. Another way of saying that would be it decreases the amount of blood the heart is getting, right? Yes. And um, it also affects how things are removed from the heart, right? Or CO2, carbon dioxide. Um, well, that's different. Um, that wouldn't happen from the blood vessels coming in, I don't think. Um, um, so I, I wouldn't include carbon dioxide in that. Um, is there a standard within forensic pathology where pathologists would consider to be that there's enough of a narrowing to cause sudden death? So the way I would describe that is anything over more than 70 to 75 percent is in the view of a forensic pathologist something that in the absence of another cause of death could be used to explain death. Okay. Now it's also true that people live with 100 percent occlusion and go on and do fine. So you have to understand this is strictly my perspective as a forensic pathologist and everyone I see is dead. So that's kind of a different perspective. Uh, can you just uh, explain what myocyte necrosis is? The myocyte is the name of the heart muscle cell. So site means cell, it's C-Y-T-E. And myo means um, muscle. So when you have a heart myocyte, it's the heart muscle cell, and necrosis means death. So if you see myocyte necrosis, that means there are dead heart muscle cells. And do you have to have myocyte necrosis to cause sudden death? Um, no, you don't have to have myocyte necrosis. Okay. And would you say that uh, hypoxia is the absence of oxygen, agreed? Yes. And uh, can a hypoxia of the heart cause sudden death by other means? Um, hypoxia. Uh, hypoxia means low oxygen, sorry. Um, and your question is, can low oxygen to the heart cause sudden death through an arrhythmia? I presume, yes. Okay. What would you, uh, how would you describe the conduction system of the heart? The way the heart beats, the lub-dub, is that there are electrical currents that go through the heart muscle. And normally there's a certain sequence in which the heart muscle will, muscles will fire. And that's called the conduction system through which the electrical impulses flow. And that's what keeps the heart beating in a regular rhythm, that beat, beat, beat. Um, and yeah, that's the conduction system. So what happens if the conduction system is impaired? Then you can get what's called an arrhythmia or abnormal beating of the heart. And that can result in sudden death? It can, yes. Which artery is, uh, supplies that kind of like that pacemaker of the heart? Oh, it probably is variable from person to person. I mean, I think the coronary artery that we consider the most important usually is the left anterior descending coronary artery, but there's a lot of individual variability. Can you, um, what about the right coronary artery? Um, that, I mean, it just, it really depends on any given person, uh, which part of the heart is supplied by their particular distribution. Okay. 
and um, in Mr. Floyd's autopsy, the right coronary artery, uh, Dr. Baker determined had a 90% occlusion, correct? 90% narrowing, yes. When someone is exerting themselves, does that make the heart work harder? Yes. Does that mean that more blood, uh, oxygen, it needs more blood to, to function? The heart needs more blood to function at that time? Yes. It's kind of like when we think about exerting anything, like jogging, running, the heart needs more blood and, and hence more oxygen in order to function properly, right? Yes. You also described the fight or flight kind of a, uh, the, the physiology of, of that in your consideration, right? Yes, the physiological stress. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the physiological stress produces adrenaline, right? Yes. And that also causes the heart to work harder? Yes. And therefore need more blood? Yes. And more oxygen? Yes. So let me ask you this. In this particular case, right, um, we have a heart that is at least above average, right, needing more blood. We have a heart with a occluded right coronary artery, right? Narrowed. Narrowed. Mm -hmm. We have a uh, heart that uh, the left anterior descending uh, artery also had a 75% narrowing, right? Yes. And so you have, you know, and then you have an exertion of stress producing adrenaline, right? Yes. So the heart has to work very, very hard in this case. Fair to yes. say? Let's take the police out of this, and I'm going to ask you a hypothetical. Let's assume you found Mr. Floyd dead in his residence. No police involvement, no drugs, right? The only thing you found would be these facts about his heart. What would you conclude to be the cause of death? In that very narrow set of circumstances, uh, I would probably conclude that the cause of death was his heart disease. So have, have you, as a forensic pathologist, ever certified a death due to uh, arterial arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease? Probably thousands of times, yes. Similar to, with similar degrees of narrowing of the arteries? Yes. Have you ever certified a death due to hypertensive cardiomegaly? I'm trying to... Yes, uh, hypertensive cardiovascular disease, yes, absolutely. With a heart at this weight or even smaller? Well, if it was, again, in this setting where that was the only abnormal finding, um, then I would probably go with that, yes. So um, one of the things that has to be considered in this particular case is uh, Mr. Floyd's heart, right? Yes. And even without any sort of an exertion, Again, take the exertion out of it, take the police out of it, take the drugs out of it. That's a potential cause of death that needs to be considered. Yes. Now, you discussed um, the abrasions that you uh, saw and the jury saw pictures of. You would agree that the abrasions are in a left to right pattern? Um, meaning there are more on the left than on the right? On his face, yes. On his shoulder, yes. And then he had the abrasions on his right hand. And even in terms of the, the pattern of the ab abrasion, there's, there's up and down abrasion. Like an abrasion could go from the bottom of my body up, or it could go from left to right, right? Yes. I guess I didn't really focus on what direction the abrasions were going in that sense. Okay. And that's fine. Um, but you would agree that one possible way that some of, at least some of these abrasions occurred would be when Mr. Floyd was initially put down on the ground. Um, I, I guess they could, yes. Right. 
and not all of those abrasions necessarily occurred while Mr. Floyd was in the prone position, right? <laughs> That's hard to answer, right. I would say. It, it's hard to answer when the abrasions were, were there and right. what caused the abrasions, right? Right, right. And if someone was being held down with, all, with the weight of three people, would you expect those to be more punctile in their nature or a, or a bra like in you know with the lines and movements oh gosh there are too many variables there i would say okay now you ultimately determined that um this case was an asphyxiation essentially right? yes that that was the primary mechanism and asphyxiation is simply the lack of oxygen to the brain? Yeah, low oxygen, inadequate oxygen. Inadequate mm -hmm. oxygen to the brain specifically. Yes. And um, in terms of asphyxiation, you would agree that there are multiple things that can cause asphyxiation? Yes. So you use the reference to someone being strangled, right? Yes. So if I came up to you and I strangled, you know, or I strangled a person, put my hands around their neck, um, there are certain things that you would expect to see, right? Sometimes you do, yes. And that's great when you do. You don't you, always, but... And those would be things like a broken hyoid bone. Yeah. Right? The petechial hemorrhaging that you discussed. Yes. And um, in an asphyxia death, there are oftentimes, frequently, those types of signs available, right? Well, it really depends on the mechanism of asphyxia. Okay, so let's go back to the mechani mechanisms of asphyxia. You described if strangling would be one, yeah. hanging would be, could be one, Yes. right? You've described positional or uh, mechanical asphyxia. Those are types, yes. Yeah. Positional being, you know, ba based on the position of the body, mechanical being something, using some sort of a device to asphyxiate someone? Oh, well, we haven't really talked a lot about positional and mechanical. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things under both of those that can cause low oxygen. And one of the things that can cause an, uh, a low oxygen to the brain is the use of controlled substances, correct? Well, eventually, yes, yes. So someone can ingest a particular type of a controlled substance. That particular substance could affect the diaphragm, right? They it, it affects the, some controlled substances affect the ability to breathe, which then decreases the oxygen, which then leads to low oxygen, yes. Right, and that's essentially um, what you're saying is, is that there in, in this particular case, as I understand it with my notes, is um, that essentially what happens is there was some event that happened that resulted in a decrease of oxygen to the brain and that resulted in, uh, de in death. Yes. And that's essentially what asphyxia is generally. Inadequate oxygen, yes. Right. Okay, and you, you were asked a series of questions about um, some studies in terms of, I think they're called the, um, they're out of San Diego or something. Yes, Dr. Chan. And Dr. Chan's, mm -hmm. right, yeah. Um, are you uh, familiar with the Journal of Forensic and Legal Medicine? Yes. Now you, you testified that some of the uh, problems with the Chan studies were that they were in laboratory, lab, lab, laboratory <laughs> settings, sorry, uh, laboratory settings, uh, that they were controlled environments, healthy individuals, etc. right? Yes. Are you familiar with um, the work of Dr. Christine Hall and her paper, Incidents and Outcome of Prone Positioning Following Police Use of Force in a Prospective Consecutive Cohort of Subjects? Is that the one from Canada? Yes. Yes. And that was essentially an analysis of actual police encounters, correct? Yes, in, in Canada. In Canada, understood. Uh, but they actually, the, the, that study, they go through and they look at the number of police citizen interactions, correct? Yes. 
and then from those police citizen interactions they further go in to look at um, how many involved being placed in the prone position or a non-prone position correct yes. they consider various actual real life variables agreed yeah and including drugs whether drugs were on board whether the length of time to a certain extent that someone was in a in the prone position agreed yes and uh, ultimately they analyzed about what was it, about 3,000 uh, prone positional placements yes out of a total of like 1.1 million police interactions yes so 1.1 million police interactions resulting in about 3,000 prone position uh, prone position arrests that those prone because these are real people real incidents right yeah and in those uh, 3,000 or so interactions there were no deaths that occurred isn't that amazing when you consider that virtually every forensic pathologist in the United States has probably had an officer involved death like this how did they it utterly baffles me which is why I kept saying Canada because I think I don't know what's different, but I'm going to object that, this time is not sorry. responsive. So the let me ask you um, in terms of hypoxia. Can you do, again define hypoxia? Uh, low oxygen. Right. Mm -hmm. And which organ is more sensitive to the uh, lack of oxygen? The brain. brain. The brain. Absolutely. The brain's the most, it needs the most oxygen, right? Yes. And that's because it's doing millions of things simultaneously, right? Agreed? Uh, yes. It, I'm sure there's lots of reasons metabolically why it needs oxygen. Right. I think a previous. Uh, a witness testified that it takes about 20% of the body's oxygen supply to function. Right? That sounds about right, yes. Um, but the heart also needs oxygen, right? Yes. So in terms of the professional standards for determining an asphy asphyxia asphyxi death, um, is it true that you have to first exclude all natural and non-natural cases or causes of death um, well you can have natural and non-natural causes of low oxygen um, so I, I'm sorry I guess I don't understand sure. there's a criteria that's established for making a determination of positional asphyxia as a cause of death, right? Um, well, I, I'm not really sure what, I'm sorry, I just, I don't understand that. Fair enough. Um, is the prone position in and of itself inherently dangerous? Not if there are no other factors. Okay. So uh, the prone position is examined and used in a lot of different settings, right? Correct. I mean, even in hospitals, in the treatment of, say, COVID, the prone position is used. Uh, is used. Correct. And in those circumstances, being in a prone position is not inherently dangerous, right? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, chiropractors put people in the prone position, right? Yes. Um, massage therapists put people <laughs> in the prone position, right? Yes. So the prone position, I'm just talking generally right. speaking, no right. other factors. The prone position in and of itself is not inherently dangerous, right? Right. Is the prone position on concrete? inherently dangerous again with no other factors as long as someone can breathe no right. I could be laying by the pool in Florida right? right on my stomach in the prone position not inherently dang dangerous 
right? Do you know, uh, or did you con take into consideration Mr. Chauvin's weight in your analysis? Oh, I'm aware of his weight. Um, I would say I took it into some consideration, but it wasn't a major factor one way or the other. Okay. Um, you reviewed all of the videos, right? Yes. And it's fair to say that um, portions of his weight were placed on Mr. Floyd's body at a different distribution. Yes. And ultimately, in terms of the autopsy that can, Dr. Baker conducted, um, in terms of the area in the shoulders, the back and the neck, no bruising was found, right? Right. Um, in, in your experience as a forensic pathologist, um, if someone is placing a significant amount of weight on a person's area for a prolonged period of time, would you expect to see bruising? You might or might not. It's so variable. And you would agree that there are no abrasions or bruising described in the autopsy in the neck area of Mr. Floyd? Correct. There's no bleeding into the muscles in his, uh, in his back, right? Correct. You would uh, agree that the knee is sort of a pointy or a more protru protuberant uh, part of the body? I guess so. Okay. Kind of flat on top because of the patella, but... And when we talk about the shin, the shin bone, the shin bone itself, there's not a lot in between the skin and the shin bone, right? That is true, yes. And it's sort of a triangular shape, right? Yes. And again, um, along Mr. Floyd's back, there's no long bruise consistent with a shin bone, right? Right. And there's no more circular bruise consistent with a kneecap. Right. You've uh, reviewed, obviously, a lot of strangulation type cases uh, in those uh, in your career? Yes. Strangulation with the hands, right? Primarily manual, but also ligature. Right. Mm -hmm. um, ligature being like a rope or a phone cord or something. Exactly. And in those manual strangulation cases, the pressure that's exerted in that will frequently leave bruises, fingerprint size bruises, right? Frequently, but not always. And ultimately, what in incre increases the likelihood of seeing a bruise is the amount of force that's applied, right? You know, I don't know what all the factors are whether it's fragility of the vessels, whether it's the length of time, whether it's the force, whether it's the location, I think there are lots of variables. So, yes. And everyone bruises differently. So, yesterday depends on what medications they may take, right? right? So, so, yesterday there was an analysis or an analogy to sitting on a church bench uh, and you don't bruise your behind. <laughs> and that can feel long. <laughs> Uh, would it be different if you're sitting on a church bench under with a with a baseball, for example, underneath your butt? I really couldn't say. All right. So, in terms of Dr. Baker's uh, autopsy, you would agree that there is really no objective evidence showing any pressure to the back of Mr. Floyd. There is nothing at the autopsy. That's correct. Did you find, uh, or did Dr. Baker find hypoxic changes in his brain? Uh, he died too quickly for that to show up. And that's when we talk about um, the lack of ischemic hypoxia, correct? 
Dr. Baker noted a lack of ischemic hypoxia. I don't remember his exact words. So you're describing lack of ischemic changes in the neurons? Correct. In yes. The, in the brain. Yes, because that has to happen over a period of time. Okay. And when someone is experiencing that shortness of oxygen or that lack of oxygen to the brain, um, that will frequently lead to certain symptoms, right? Yes. Um, confusion is one. That could be, yes. Restlessness. Could be, yes. Shortness of breath. Could be. Visual changes. Could be. Mm -hmm. Incoherent speaking. Could be. So, um, to your knowledge, did Mr. Floyd, uh, in the videos that you observed, ever complain of these visual cha any visual changes? Um, no. Did he appear to be confused to you? So what time, I guess, what time period are we talking about? Sorry. Sure, that, that helps, maybe if we narrow down that time. The nine minutes, during the nine minutes that Mr. Floyd was uh, restrained, did he appear uh, confused to you? Oh, gosh. How do you describe his behavior? Well, I mean, did, did he, he was articulating that he was in pain, right? You yes, and then he couldn't breathe and he calls for his mother and he says he loves people. I mean, you might interpret that as confusion or you might interpret it a different way. I... Did he appear to be breathing during this time frame? Not effectively. Do you know how many breaths per minute? No. If uh, one expert indicated it was at a rate of 22 breaths per minute, would you disagree? I would have no way of assessing that. When someone is hypoxic, they start breathing faster, right? That can be a mechanism mm -hmm. of trying to balance. At least uh, for the first five minutes or so, Mr. Floyd was talking, right? Well, again. I mean, talking, yes or no, he was talking. He was, yes, there, was, there were words, yes. So he had an open airway. Yes. And you'd agree that, um, or would you agree that at some point he went limp? Yes. Right? And would you describe what you saw as the progression of hypoxia in that instance at the point he goes limp? <clears throat> that is certainly a good explanation for it, yes. was not a sudden hypoxic event, right? That is my interpretation, yes. You would agree that if he was progressively growing hypoxic, you would expect whole body hypoxia? I'll, I'll rephrase my yeah, question. Yeah, sorry. I'm not a doctor, so I have to rely on my notes quite a bit. So if he was progressively suffering from whole body hypoxia, the brain would be the first thing that would uh, have show signs of hypoxia. Oh, I see. Yes. Yes, the brain is the most sensitive. And you would agree that um, that would not occur in a matter of seconds, but it would take a matter of minutes, right? Correct. And asphyxia due to position or compression that prevents air from getting into the lungs, right? Yes. And that leads to what we would call a global hypoxia? Um, we haven't really used that word global. Um, Whole body. I mean, if there's inadequate oxygen the blood flows everywhere, so I, I guess that's what you're talking about. I'm but the brain is the first thing to show symptoms of hypoxia. Right, that's the most sensitive organ. 
And in this particular case where you have a 90% stenosis of the um, right coronary artery, that's going to be limiting uh, oxygen to the heart, right? Yes. And he has a big heart, right? Yes. Needs more blood. Yes. And adrenaline speeds up the heart. Yes. Methamphetamine speeds up the heart. It can, yes. So methamphetamine and adrenaline cause the work to the heart to work harder. Yes. And, inc happened. and increases the heart's oxygen needs. Yes. And at what point does the stenosis in the left and right coronary arteries become critical and cause the heart to stop? Generally. Oh. As a, are you asking that same question about as a forensic pathologist, what degree of narrowing do we consider potentially fatal? Right. 70, 75% and above. Now, in terms of um, drug use, right, you obviously were aware based on the toxicology that Mr. Floyd had certain drugs in his system, right? Yes. And so when we say on board, that means in the system. Yes. Okay. Um, would you describe the use as, a, as you know, based on the information that you have, uh, as sort of a binge use of drugs? Oh, I guess I couldn't, I couldn't answer that. Um, are you familiar with um, drug use uh, taken or used interrectally? Interrect I've heard of that, yes. yes. And that increases or speeds up the distribution of controlled substances in a person? Um, it speeds up absorption, yes. So the effects would be felt much faster. Yes, they could. Mm -hmm. In a in a case where you have a um, person who is uh, experiencing uh, cardiac arrest, right, and they're put in an ambulance and taken to the hospital for resuscitation, uh, there often uh, there's IVs that are placed in a person, right? Yes. And those IVs contain saline. Yes. And saline can ultimately dilute or decrease, to some degree, the amount of controlled substances that would be met as they would be measured. That's a theoretical possibility. You'd agree that fentanyl is a respiratory depressant, right? Yes. It slows breathing and lowers oxygen in the blood. It, yes. Does the fact that there's norfentanyl in his blood mean that he took it some time ago? Yes, but by some time, that's, that's a very vague, yeah. So long enough in the past to start metabolizing. Exactly, exactly. But does it exclude him taking fentanyl more acutely or more recently in time? Um, no, there's no way really of knowing the timing. Um, fentanyl depressing the respiratory system can also act with the coronary artery uh, ves or can interact with coronary vessel disease, correct? Um, uh, can you clarify that? Sure. I'm sorry. Does fentanyl's depression of the respiratory system also act with coronary artery vessel disease and oxygen and carbon dioxide to reduce the supply of the, its supply to the heart. Oh, so as fentanyl may lead to a gradual progression of slowing breathing and ultimately decrease the oxygen, that would apply to oxygen to the brain as well as to the heart. Is that what you're... Yeah. And it would likewise increase uh, the carbon dioxide in the blood. Um, yeah. I mean, anything that decreases respiration decreases 
that exchange. Right. Mm -hmm. So as that exchange process is happening, right, you're not taking in the oxygen, you're likewise not expelling the carbon dioxide, right? Right. And thus the carbon dioxide will increase because you're not expelling it, right? Correct. You would agree that methamphetamine is a stimulant, right? Correct. And that can cause a cardiac arrhythmia? It can. And it can increase a person's heart rate, right? Uh, it can or cannot. And you testified before that uh, methamphetamine, there's no safe level of methamphetamine, right? Correct. So the, the fact that methamphetamine is at a lower toxicological standard doesn't somehow make it safe. Right. Um, it doesn't, doesn't exclude the possibility that um, it could increase the heart rate. It could or not. The, in terms of uh, the evidence in this case, were you made aware that um, drugs were found in the back seat of the squad car? Yes. And that those drugs uh, contained the DNA of Mr. Floyd? Yes. And that those drugs were at least to some degree partially dissolved? Yes. And um, that those drugs were fentanyl, a mixture of fentanyl and methamphetamine? Yes. Based on the toxico toxicology in this case, uh, did you see any metabolic byproduct of methamphetamine? No. Right. And so that means that the methamphetamine was taken more acutely or recently in time? Probably. I mean, there's lots of variables. So again, just kind of taking into consideration removing certain variables, right? You find a person at at home, no struggle with the police, right? Um, and you, the person doesn't have a heart problem, but you find fentanyl and methamphetamine in this person's system at the levels that they are at, would you certify this as an overdose? Again, in the absence of any of these other realities, um, yes. I could consider that to be an overdose. And the level of fentanyl in a person, um, again, in this hypothetical scenario, um, there are deaths certified as drug overdoses significantly lower than 11 nanograms per milliliter. Lower, higher, it's, it's got a huge range, yes. As low, I believe, as 3% or 3 nanograms per milliliter. Yes. Right? So the ingestion of drugs is unique to that individual's body, right? Right. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Ms. Fletcher. Dr. Thomas, a few things I'd like to try to clarify with you. Thank you. Uh, you were asked a number of questions that were to the effect that if we take the police subdual restraint and neck compression out of this, what would you conclude Mr. Floyd's cause of death to Ben? Remember those questions? Oh, yes. Uh, aren't those questions a lot like asking Mrs. Lincoln, yeah. if we take John, John Wilkes Booth out of this, uh, may I finish? It's my no, analogy. That's argument. Argument. Dr. Thomas, mm -hmm. uh, if we put the police of dual compression and neck uh, compression, into this, restraint uh, and neck compression into this, what was the cause, the manner of death for Mr. George Floyd? The cause of death was the law enforcement, so dual restraint and compression, and the manner of death is homicide. Does it make any sense to you whatsoever from the standpoint of trying to assess cause and manner of death for Mr. Floyd 
to be a answering questions having to do with hypothetically taking the facts of this case out relating to his subdual restraint and neck compression. She's a, you, you can finish the question. Uh, Dr. Uh, Thomas, from your standpoint as a forensic pathologist and your analysis of manner and cause of death, uh, would you ever approach an assessment of manner and cause of death by taking out of it the facts that you found relevant and highly pertinent to assessing and determining the manner and cause of death? No. And in this case, those factors are what? The law enforcement subdual restraint and compression. And uh, you were asked questions again about fentanyl and meth. Uh, remember those questions? Yes. Uh, do you know what quantity of meth uh, was even involved or found in Mr. Floyd's bloodstream? Uh, I have the number. Well, let, let me ask you a question. But it was very small. I mean, I do know that. And so this was the point. It, you found it, that it was a very small amount. Correct. Uh, were you able to assess, based on the amount, what kind of effect, if at all, it would have on the stress or strain on his heart? No. It, it, There's too much individual variability to correlate one number with one person's reaction. Well, let's see with respect to fentanyl. If there is a, a punchline we can get to with respect to fentanyl. Um, fentanyl has been uh, discussed uh, with, uh, with you, Dr. Thomas, as a respiratory either depressant or suppressant. Yes. Uh, in order for us to go from fentanyl to death, in the middle, there are certain symptoms and responses and reactions a person would have who's suffering from fentanyl overdose or intoxication. Yes. Uh, if the person doesn't have those symptoms, uh, those indicators, then would you feel that it's possible even to conclude that they are suffering from fentanyl intoxication or overdose? Uh, no. If there's no signs of fentanyl overdose, then it makes no sense to conclude that there was an overdose from fentanyl. And to be clear for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what are those symptoms of fentanyl overdose or intoxication? So fentanyl is an opioid, it's like morphine or heroin, and it causes slowing, well, first of all, it's a potent pain medication and given mostly for that, but it also can cause slowing of the respiratory rate in a very gradual, peaceful, uh, non-struggle kind of way. What is described is people just fall asleep and uh, may just kind of slump gradually over because they very peacefully stop breathing, or it slows and then eventually stops. And they fall into a sleep out of which they can't even be aroused. Correct. Uh, would that be also known as a coma? Yes, ultimately it's a coma. Uh, when George Floyd was on the ground for the nine minutes and 29 seconds, was he sleep to the point of not being able to be aroused? Not for the first half of it, no. And then afterwards, he was completely unresponsive, but that's a different. For the second half, even unresponsive with no pulse. Exactly. Uh, was George Floyd, during the nine minutes and 29 seconds, ever in a coma that you saw? No. Um, so when we talk about fentanyl um, overdose, did you ever see, as applied to George Floyd, Floyd during the nine minutes and 29 seconds? Okay. Did you, did you ever see, as it relates to fentanyl overdose, during the nine minutes and 29 uh, seconds, that he was on the ground, enduring the subdual and restraint by Mr. Chauvin, that he ever exhibited any of this, the symptoms of fentanyl intoxication? No. You ask again quite a few questions about the heart. And remember that discussion? Yes. Uh, I think uh, it was to the fact the heart was slightly enlarged, uh, high blood pressure, narrowing of the coronary arteries, um, uh, dead heart muscle cells. Do you recall all of that being yes. discussed? Yes. 
in order for us to go from there being issues with damage to the heart to a death from damage to the heart in the middle uh, do we have to have certain cardiac events that then lead to death yes would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury if we're going to talk about heart conditions what are those conditions in the middle that actually lead to death well, what ultimately leads to death is an arrhythmia, an abnormal beating of the heart. And as I described, it's generally a called, I mean, it's often called a sudden cardiac arrest because it's sudden and someone just drops over. Now, to be clear, when we're talking about these various heart conditions and a sudden cardiac arrest, a fatal arrhythmia, did you see any indication of all this discussion about heart conditions that Mr. Floyd ever suffered from a sudden fatal cardiac arrhythmia as the primary cause of death? No. Uh, did, was there any evidence that Mr. Floyd suffered from a heart attack? No. Uh, if you uh, bring to mind what was found during the autopsy, was there any injury found to Mr. Floyd's heart whatsoever? No. So if we talk about, for example, uh, dead heart muscle cells, any dead heart muscle cells seen on autopsy? Not that Dr. Baker described and not that I saw, no. In fact, his heart was so ordinary in terms of non-injury that it wasn't even photographed intact, was it? Not intact, no. Dr. Baker took one photo that showed no scars and no acute injury. Now, you were asked about uh, certain studies out of Canada yes. on the prone position. Yes. And, now, uh, and the findings out of Canada, su supposedly with real police and real police settings, was no fatalities. Yes. Are you familiar with any such studies reaching that conclusion in the United States of America? No. Um, what is so peculiar then about Canada that we're talking about Canadian studies here? That's what I don't understand. I don't, I mean, yeah, I found that study and I just thought, I don't know how to interpret this because it just, it's so contrary to the actual experience of forensic pathologists in the United States. Now you ask questions about whether the prone position is uh, safe to lay on your stomach. Yes. Um, are you familiar with whether or not uh, laying in the prone position automatically brings about a reduction in the oxygen reserves somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 20 to 24 percent? I am not aware of that, but I would defer to a clinician. Uh, perhaps a pulmonologist? That would be the best, yes. Uh, I think uh, you were, in fact, ask a question about uh, laying by the pool on my stomach in Florida. Yes. George Floyd was not laying by the pool on his stomach in Florida, was he? No. I know the answer to this, but I'll ask you. You ask a question about sitting on a church bench with a baseball under your butt. You've never done that. No. Now, you were asked questions about symptoms of damage uh, to the brain. Yes. And whether there was any evidence of damage to Mr. Floyd's brain. Yes. Uh, would you tell uh, the ladies and gentlemen of the jury whether the fact that you observed an anoxic seizure in Mr. Floyd, was that evidence of damage to the brain? So, yes. What happens in the brain is when there's inadequate oxygen, it reacts by causing this anoxic reaction or seizure that we've described. <clears throat> if someone then goes on and essentially is brain dead, but their heart can be restarted and they're kept alive for say a day and then they die, then you will see changes in the brain. But in a, 
case like Mr. Floyd, where he died during this period of time and his heart was never able to be restarted, that is not enough time for the brain cells to show any kind of reaction that you could see at autopsy. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. No further questions. Any further? Yes, Dr. Thomas, um, after the heart stops, if the heart stops, is it possible that the body will continue to breathe or respire? Um, yes, I suppose it could in some circumstances. And that could, that continued respiration after the heart stops could be a matter of a minute or two, correct? I suppose that could happen. And you would agree that methamphetamine also further constricts uh, the arteries, right? It can do that. And um, so that constriction, there's been a lot of discussion about the level of methamphetamine in, this, in the system, this low level as it's been described, right? You, you said there's no safe level, agreed? Yes. Would you, um, as a physician, prescribe methamphetamine to a person who has uh, a 90% or a 75% occlusion to his or her heart? Objection, I was beyond the scope and realm. You may answer if you have an opinion in that regard. Yeah, I don't have an opinion, I'm sorry. Okay, no further questions. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Uh, you're excused. Members of the jury will take our lunch recess. We'll reconvene at 1.30.
Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Your Honor. For our next witness, the state calls Dr. Andrew Baker. Swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Let's see. And if we could begin by having you state your full name, spelling each of your names. My full name is Andrew Michael Baker, A N D R E W M I C H A E L B A K E R. Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Dr. Baker. Good afternoon. You know, before we, well, first of all, you conducted the autopsy on Mr. George Floyd. I did. Before we get into the specifics of the, uh, the autopsy, uh, why don't we explore your background a bit? Uh, you're the, uh, the Chief Hennepin County Medical Examiner? That's correct. And would you tell us what it means to be the Chief Medical Examiner in Hennepin County? So I've been the Chief Medical Examiner for Hennepin County since 2004. Um, I'm actually the chief medical examiner for Hennepin, Dakota, and Scott counties. My office provides service to all three of those counties, which is about 1.85 million Minnesotans, or about a third of the state, um, falls within our catchment area. Being the chief medical examiner means that I supervise the rest of the staff, in particular my other physicians. I have six other doctors as well as a doctor in training that work under me. And so before becoming the chief, you were the assistant chief? Correct. And uh, that was in roughly 2002? Correct. I was the assistant chief medical examiner for two years. So all in, it's been going on 19 years as either assistant chief or the chief? Correct. Uh, what did you do before joining the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office? Um, are you asking me to go back to my educational background or just my postgraduate training? Maybe to the Air Force. To the Air Force? Oh, prior to coming to Hennepin County from 1998 to 2002, I was a major on active duty in the United States Air Force. I served as a forensic pathologist for the Department of Defense. Um, our unit was known as the Armed Forces Medical Examiner, and at that time we were headquartered in the Washington, D.C. area. Are you uh, board certified in any areas? I am. Would you tell us which ones? I am board certified in anatomic and clinical pathology, and I hold subspecialty certification in forensic pathology. Uh, doctor, would you tell us what the National Association of Medical Examiners is? Yes, the National Association of Medical Examiners is the professional organization for people who do what I do for a living. Um, I want to say we have about eight or 900 members. Um, many of those are fellows like me, meaning they're fully board certified forensic pathologists. We do have a variety of other membership categories as well for investigators, for administrative personnel, and for other support personnel um, in the profession. Now, you uh, are a former president of the National Association of Medical Examiners. Yes, I am. In fact, uh, at least as of to date, uh, you are the youngest president, or were the youngest president uh, ever to hold that position with the NAME. I, I don't actually know that that's true, but I will take your word for it, Counselor. <laughs> I, I, I did not know that. Yeah, I thought I was just listening to you, Dr. Baker. <laughs> so, um, but in any event, you have been the president of NAME. Yes, I have. Um, so let's move now to the uh, specific uh, autopsy of, uh, of Mr. Floyd. Uh, could you give us some sense of what you knew about the, uh, the circumstances surrounding his death before you started your work um, on Mr. Floyd? Yes, so I was aware that Mr. Floyd had become unconscious while in police custody, that he had been transported to Hennepin Healthcare, and that that was where he was pronounced dead. I believe at the time I started the examination, my staff was probably still working to confirm Mr. Floyd's identity and uh, properly notify his next of kin. But that was basically the background information that I had. H had you seen any of the videos at the time you started your work? I had not. I was aware that at least one video had gone viral on the internet, but I intentionally chose not to look at that until I had examined Mr. Floyd. Um, I did not want to bias my exam by going in with any preconceived notions that might lead me down one pathway or another. So it was then several days after you'd done your work on the autopsy that you saw the videos? 
one video I saw shortly after the autopsy, and that was the one that I think most of the public had seen through Facebook or other social media. The other videos, such as the cup surveillance video and the body-worn camera videos, I did not see until three or four days after the autopsy. Could, could you, Dr. Baker, give us uh, an overview of how it is you conduct autopsies? What's your approach to them? Sure. So in a case that's believed to be a homicide or a potential homicide, there's a few more steps involved than a typical natural death or an accidental death. We start every exam with a very thorough external examination of the decedent's body in an as-is condition, meaning the medical devices are still in place. If the decedent came in with clothing, that clothing would still be in place on their body. All of those things potentially could be evidence to us as the medical examiners. Um, in many cases, we will also collect trace evidence. For example, if the decedent's fingernails are long enough, we will collect fingernail clippings. We will collect some pulled head hairs as exemplars in case those are needed to match to anything. It wouldn't apply in Mr. Floyd's case, but in other circumstances, we shoot um, a fair number of x-rays before the autopsy starts if we're looking for things like bullets or stab wounds, broken knife tips, that sort of thing. Once all of those are done, then we very carefully set the clothing aside. Um, we very carefully remove the medical advice, devices, and then we examine the body again from head to toe, front and back. We're documenting this with copious photographs as we go. And then the final step in the external examination is we clean the body very, very thoroughly because we don't want any blood, any foreign material, any plant material, anything that might be on the body to obscure the injuries or diseases that we're looking for. And then we, again, photograph the body um, head to toe front and back. Once that part of the exam is done, then we proceed to the internal exam, which is, I think, what most lay people would think of when they hear the word autopsy. We make a set of very careful incisions on the body that allow us to remove all of the organs one by one so we can look for evidence of natural disease, internal evidence of injury, and while we're doing that, we're collecting specimens for toxicology. Typically, blood and urine are the ideal specimens. Um, we do remove all of the organs from the tip of the tongue to the bladder. Um, we also remove the brain. We also remove all of the structures from the front of the neck, looking for any injury or evidence of disease. Um, in a case like Mr. Floyd's, there are some additional steps we will take that wouldn't occur in most autopsies. So for example, in Mr. Floyd's case, I did make incisions of his wrists and dissect around the skin underneath to look for evidence of what we would call subcutaneous bruising or bruising under the skin from the handcuffs that were applied. Or old. Please continue. And then the last thing that I was going to say is also in Mr. Floyd's case, um, I did make a special incision from the back of his head all the way down to his buttocks, and I dissected underneath his skin all the way out to the sides of his neck, all the way out to his shoulders, and all the way out to his flanks. And you might ask why we would do something like that, and the answer is because sometimes fresh bruises can be difficult to see in some people, and so we look underneath the skin to make sure that we haven't missed something. Again, those last few steps wouldn't be part of a typical autopsy, but in circumstances like this, um, it's a generally accepted practice that we do that. And, and Dr. Baker, is the autopsy part of a broader death investigation? Yes, the autopsy is just one piece of the medical examiner's death investigation. And could you generally characterize the, uh, the, the umbrella? What's the, uh, the, the death investigation entail uh, overall? So the, the medical examiner's ultimate mission, in addition to properly identifying people, is to ascertain their cause of death and their manner of death. The autopsy is just one component of that. It obviously has a great deal to do to inform the cause of death and manner of death, but we also need to know the decedent's past medical history. We need to get a hold of the decedent's next of kin to see if the decedent could potentially be a donor, if there's any family history that we need to know about, we will typically contact decedent's primary care physicians as well as get their hospital records. Um, if an ambulance was dispatched and took them to the hospital, we'll even get the ambulance run sheet as part of our investigation. Uh, because to get the cause and manner of death right, you need to assemble all of those things for the whole picture. So, so let's go back to the uh, autopsy aspect of it. Uh, how important is it to have a detailed documentation of what you do? In terms of the autopsy? Yes, sir. Well, it's critically important that the autopsy be very detailed, particularly if the death is potentially a homicide, because obviously it could end up in the court and the work that you're doing would be evidence. And, and do you create uh, what we might refer to as a robust data set 
documenting what you do. Yes. What, what's all included in that? So when I use the term robust data set, what I really mean is I have dictated the most detailed autopsy report that I can, describing all the scars, all the tattoos, all the birthmarks, all the injuries. In many cases, it's the pertinent negatives, meaning the lack of injury, places where you might expect to see an injury, but you don't. All of those things are very carefully dictated in a narrative autopsy report. Um, but that's not enough. You have to take copious photography as well. Um, I, my goal is to create a set of photos that's so robust that another pathologist could take my set of photos and almost feel like they'd been there for the autopsy. That person has enough data that they could look at my work and reach their own conclusions. They don't have to take my word for it because it's in the photos. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Mr. George Floyd, that's what you did? That was certainly my goal, yes. Your Honor, at this point, uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Baker to identify the uh, photographs from the autopsy. I still have them here in hard copy. Right. May I approach Dr. Baker, Your Honor? Dr. Baker, I've handed you uh, a number of photographs that should have uh, exhibit numbers 186, 235, 185, 236, 187, 188, 189, 190, 191, and 192. I'll represent to you that's what you have. Okay. And if you could uh, just look through the set and just confirm for the record. Uh, that those are photographs that you took uh, during your autopsy of Mr. George Floyd. So these are, in fact, autopsy photographs of Mr. Floyd, and they were taken by me. Thank you, Dr. Baker. I'd like to redistribute them to uh, the jury on. So, Dr. Baker, let me just ask you generally first uh, about documented injuries uh, that you saw with respect to Mr. George Floyd, and I'll ask you about specific parts of the body. Okay. Uh, did you note any injuries to Mr. Floyd's back? I did not. Uh, didn't see any bruises, scrapes, et cetera? Correct. Uh, what about the injuries to Mr. Floyd's face? Yes, Mr. Floyd had several injuries to his face. And if you could, uh, Dr. Baker, look at Exhibit 186 and Exhibit 235. I'll represent to you that jurors have seen these uh, two photos, but uh, is the, first tell us what, what do we see in these two photos? These are photographs of the left side of Mr. Floyd's face. Um, this would be after I have removed or cut away any medical intervention. Um, had there been any blood or foreign material on his body, it was cleaned up before these photographs were taken as well. 
And these were specifically taken to illustrate the injuries that you see on the corner of his left eyebrow and on his left cheek. Um, you can see the bruising and the abrasion. That's fancy medical lingo for the, the big scrape on the left side of his forehead. And you can see the scrape or the abrasion on the left side of his cheek. Um, it's very common for abrasions post-mortem to take on that dark black color. Um, af after death, the moisture that would be in an abrasion on you or me isn't there anymore. And so they tend to dry out and look a little bit more like this. That's why what you see in the photo. Do you have a, an opinion as to how Mr. Floyd would have uh, incurred these abrasions? Well, these would be entirely consistent with the left side of his face being pinned against the, the asphalt or the road surface that he was on the night before. In the prone position? Correct. Mm -hmm. If you would, Dr. Baker, look at Exhibit 185. What do we see in Exhibit 185? This is an overall photograph of Mr. Floyd's face um, taken early on in the post-mortem examination. You can see the scale there in the photograph. That's actually in all the photos you have with this case number and the scale allows you to gauge the size of what you're looking at. This is a photograph I would take in any case so that you can put a face with the decedent's name and the decedent's case number. Uh, you can see the, the, the injuries that we illustrated in the previous two photos there on the left side of his head and on his left cheek. You can also see a small abrasion on the left side of his forehead. It's the, kind of that pinpoint thing about an inch above his left eyebrow. You can see a laceration, which is a, a tearing of the skin on the right side of his upper lip. Um, there's also some subtle bruising of his nose and a couple of small abrasions on the right side of his nose. And I think you can see a few small abrasions under the left corner of his mouth. And, and Dr. Baker, what, what is the tube that we see in his mouth? The tube in Mr. Floyd's mouth is the endotracheal tube that was put in uh, during the attempt to resuscitate him. We do leave those tubes in place and cut them off before we start the autopsy. That's some quality control that we do for the hospital and the paramedics so that we can confirm the tube was in the right place when we do our exams. So Dr. Baker, if you would uh, go to exhibit 187. What do we see in Exhibit 187? This is a close-up photograph of Mr. Floyd's right shoulder. Um, centered in the photograph just above the scale, you can see what I would call an abraded contusion, which is a fancy medical lingo for a bruise that has some scraping superimposed on it. In Exhibit 188? Exhibit 188 is the close-up photograph of Mr. Floyd's left shoulder. Um, you can see occupying most of the photograph, there is an abrasion, the, the deep red and slightly less red and pink injury that you see. Um, again, it looks darker than you might envision this on yourself. Typically, these will dry out after death, and that's why it takes that darker appearance. And is this an injury that is consistent with Mr. Floyd laying prone on asphalt? Yes. And let's look at exhibits 189 and 190. What do we see in Exhibits 189 and 190? Exhibit 189 is a photograph of the back side of Mr. Floyd's left hand. Exhibit number 190 is a photograph of the back side of Mr. Floyd's right hand. Um, in any case that we think has the potential to be a homicide, we do examine the hands very carefully and we photograph the hands very carefully. Um, our hands are largely the way that we interact with the world around us and so injuries on the hands, or sometimes lack thereof, can tell us something about what happened. Specifically in Mr. Floyd's case, you can see a number of scar-like areas on his knuckles on the left and some scattered across the back of his right hand. Um, I don't specifically know what those are from. Those obviously predate um, the events of his death, and I don't know where those came from. The more acute injuries that you see in the photograph, um, right above the scale in each picture, you can see kind of a patterned bruise. It almost looks like a tram track, those parallel marks. That's pretty typical for what handcuff marks look like when we see them at autopsy. And Dr. Baker, Exhibit 191. 
Exhibit number 191 is a close-up photograph of the back of the index and third fingers of Mr. Floyd's right hand. You can see that he's got some injuries over his knuckles. Um, just for orientation, if I were to use my own right hand, we're looking at an injury right here and an injury right here on the back of those two fingers. And did you have an opinion as to what may be the cause of, uh, of those injuries? So these are blunt force injuries. These are abrasions and lacerations. Again, that's damage to the skin from blunt trauma. Um, these would be entirely consistent with him having been in an altercation with another person. Um, they certainly could be from the asphalt or just about anything his hand could have banged into. Thank you, Dr. Baker, and uh, you can put the photos. We can put the photos away. Now, I'd like to talk with you for just a moment about your examination of Mr. Floyd's heart. Okay. Uh, did you take a photograph of Mr. Floyd's heart still intact? No, I did not. Uh, would you tell the jury um, why not? I don't normally photograph organs that appear to be for perfectly normal um, unless there's some reason to. I don't have a photograph of Mr. Floyd's spleen or Mr. Floyd's liver um, either um, because those were also grossly normal. His heart was enlarged by weight but that wouldn't really be something you could capture in a photograph unless it were so excessively enlarged that, that it would be obvious from the, from the picture. Mm -hmm. and, and so when we talk about the, uh, the tissues of the heart, uh, are you able to describe them generally, such as the endocardium, uh, the myocardium, et cetera? Sure. Would you tell the jurors what those are that you ordinarily look at? Yeah, so um, dissecting the heart is one of the most important things we do in every autopsy because the heart is involved in so many of the deaths that we investigate. So the first thing we do is we carefully remove the heart from the lungs. The next thing you do is you carefully make sure that there's no blood or clot left in the heart because you want to get a very accurate weight. Um, it turns out that the weight of the heart is a very good predictor as to whether that heart is normal or not. Um, people who have high blood pressure for a long period of time, their heart will actually get heavier. Just like any muscle that's, that's worked hard, the heart will grow in response to that kind of stress. So we do weigh the heart first. The next thing you typically do is you very carefully dissect the coronary arteries. And when I say carefully dissect, I mean you take a scalpel blade and you cut every two, three, four millimeters in very fine slices along every one of the coronary arteries. A normal adult heart will generally be described as having two coronary arteries, the left and the right. The left immediately branches into the left anterior descending and the left circumflex. So we dissect those two very carefully and then we look at the right coronary artery. So usually you'll hear people describe three coronary arteries, the circumflex, the left anterior, descending, and the right. So we wanna make sure those arteries are in the right place. We wanna make sure they have normal openings where they connect to the aorta. And then we go tiny slice by tiny slice, making sure that none of those arteries have narrowings or blockages in them. After we've done that, then we typically will carefully slice the heart meaning the whole organ where we're now cutting through the muscle. And as you're making those slices, what you're looking for is evidence of previous heart damage. Is there a scar in the heart? Is there hemorrhage in the heart, suggesting maybe a more recent heart attack, if you will? There's many more rare conditions of the heart that we're also looking for while we do this. None of those apply in Mr. Floyd's case, but those are always in the back of our minds as we do this. And then the last thing we do is once we've cut through the muscle of the heart, we open all the valves of the heart generally in the same direction the blood flows. We make sure the valve leaflets are normal, make sure there's no infections, there's no calcifications, there's the normal number of leaflets. Um, so yeah, we've now, we've now looked at the outside of the heart, the coronaries, the muscle of the heart, and the valves. So, so having done all of that with respect to Mr. Floyd, uh, did you find any previous damage to his heart muscle? No, Mr. Floyd had no visible or microscopic previous damage to his heart muscle. You know, and I apologize to you, Dr. Baker, and the jury, but there is one other photograph I do want to look at. Okay. So if, uh, if we could pull out uh, just number 192, which uh, should be the heart valves. 
Dr. Baker, would you tell us what we see in Exhibit 192? Yes, Exhibit 192 is cross-sections of the what I would describe as the worst or the narrowest lesions that I found in Mr. Floyd's coronary arteries. So above about the three mark on the ruler, you can see three pieces of coronary artery that are fairly close together. The uppermost one in your photograph is what we would call the proximal left anterior descending coronary artery. So that means that's pretty close to the aorta, that's close to the origin of the artery. And in most adults, the left anterior descending is the largest of the three coronary arteries. So in this picture, you can see that Mr. Floyd's left anterior descending or artery is, is quite narrowed. Um, I would put that at 75% narrowing. The cut that you see right below that, which is the middle of the three, that's another section through Mr. Floyd's left anterior descending coronary artery. So you can see that that area of very tight narrowing is still there. Again, I would put that at about 75%. Um, and then the third one you see in that series of three, the one closest to the ruler, is the first branch off of his left anterior descending coronary artery. Um, that's called the first diagonal branch. Um, that can be a big one in some people. It was pretty good sized in Mr. Floyd's case, but that one is also quite narrowed, as you can see in the photograph. And I should probably back up and explain that when I, mean, when I say narrowed, I mean the yellow plaque that you see eccentrically lining those coronary arteries, like a partially clogged plumbing pipe. That's the, that's the cholesterol, that's the fibrous tissue, that's the scar that you don't want in your coronary arteries. That's why your doctor checks your cholesterol and asks you not to smoke and tells you to watch your weight and your blood pressure. This is what he or she is trying to pre prevent is that plaque buildup. That's the, the yellow discoloration you see in these arteries. They should be wide open. You should be seeing through a round hole in each of those, but, it, but they're pretty severely narrowed. So getting back to the description of the photograph, the fourth cross section you see, which is more closer to the one on the scale, that's Mr. Floyd's right coronary artery. In most adults, that would be the second largest of the three coronaries. You can see that one is also significantly narrowed by atherosclerotic plaque as well. So, uh, Dr. Baker, are you kind of familiar with the concept of acute changes in plaque buildup? Yes. Uh, would you tell the jurors what that means? So there are times at autopsy when we can tell that a plaque has suddenly changed because it has fractured. These plaques can actually be kind of hard. That's why this is known as hardening of the coronary arteries. Sometimes these plaques will fracture and you can see clot or fibrin, which is protein from the blood, suddenly filling that plaque. And so the plaque went from being smaller than it used to be to being bigger than it used to be very, very quickly. Um, sometimes you can even get hemorrhage into a plaque as it fractures, and so the plaque can grow very quickly. We can, we can see that with the naked eye at autopsy. Sometimes we can see that under the microscope as well. Um, to get to the heart of your question, counselor, I did not see those changes in Mr. Floyd's coronary arteries. These looked to me to be, I guess you would call them stable plaques, for lack of a better term. And, and if they had fractured in some way and created a, a clot, uh, of some kind. Would that be observable on autopsy? Yes, and that's one of the reasons we dissect these arteries so carefully is you wouldn't want to miss an acute change or a thrombus because in most cases that would tell you a lot about how the person died. Mm -hmm. and, and if there were a thrombus and it affected the heart muscle, what would that look like if you had such an affected heart muscle on autopsy? If we find a thrombus, which means a, an acute clot in a coronary artery, if the person dies very, very quickly, which is entirely possible, we won't see anything abnormal in the heart muscle that depends on that coronary artery for its survival. People typically need to survive for hours from their acute cardiac event before we can see any changes in the heart, either under the microscope or with the naked eye. So again, if a person dies very, very quickly from a coronary artery event, we, we can only infer what happened based on the fact that they have bad coronaries and the circumstances of their death. We wouldn't expect the heart muscle to look abnormal. And if uh, the heart muscle does show damage from a clot, what does that look like? So that depends on how long the clot has been there and how long the person has survived. Um, there's a generally good progression of changes that we see very, very early, all you might see under the microscope is some of the heart cells start to look a little bit wavy and abnormal. Um, shortly after that, they start to take on way more pigment under the microscope than the surrounding heart cells do. They look much brighter to us under the microscope. Then those heart cells start to die or necrose, as we say in pathology. That necrosis then brings in an inflammatory reaction from the body. And so you see inflammatory cells come and start to clean up those dead heart cells.
And then eventually the body will bring in what we call granulation tissue, which is new blood vessels and early scar tissue. And if the person survives long enough, that, that dead area of heart will just turn into a scar. Um, dead heart cells, unfortunately, don't grow back. And so once they die, depending on how long the person survives, we'll see anything from those very early changes all the way out to a, a scar. But, but with respect to Mr. Mr. Floyd, uh, you didn't see any damage to the heart muscle. That's, That's correct. correct. Let, let's talk about the, uh, the brain. Uh, did you note any uh, injury or damage to his brain tissues? I did not. I did not notice any acute injury to his brain in the sense of physical trauma, nor did I note any injury to his brain in the sense of it being deprived of blood or oxygen. Did you note anything uh, regarding Mr. Floyd's lungs? Mr. Floyd's lungs were quite edematous, meaning they had a lot of fluid and congestion in them. But other than that, they were generally normal post-mortem lungs. And, and is it possible to get uh, fluid on the lungs or edematous lungs, I think you called it, from the uh, efforts to resuscitate Mr. Floyd uh, after he was taken from the scene? Yes. Uh, and what, what kinds of fluids could cause that? Well. Basically, what we're seeing at autopsy is just called edema fluid, which is a lightly protein-filled fluid that seeps out of the blood into the lungs and fills up the breathing spaces. We see that in people who have had protracted CPR, who've been given lots of fluid. Um, you know, as their heart's not working very well, perhaps not at all during the CPR, they're still getting a lot of fluid put in them um, in the emergency room. And so we can see that pulmonary edema from that. There's other circumstances in which we see pulmonary edema as well. It's a, it's a fairly nonspecific finding. And, and so in, in this instance, with respect to Mr. Floyd, uh, you, you, you didn't or didn't need to take the time uh, to try to understand what was the source of his pulmonary edema. I don't know that I could pinpoint point the source with any accuracy. Again, given that he got CPR, there's multiple potential explanations for his pulmonary edema. What about uh, the prospect of what's called a pulmonary embolism? Uh, what is a pulmonary embolism? A pulmonary embolism is when you have a clot form in another part of your body. Most commonly it's in the lower legs or the pelvis, although it can form in other places. And that clot breaks off and it goes straight to the lungs because that's where your heart pumps all the blood as it returns from your body. Um, a massive pulmonary embolism can be almost instantaneously fatal. And by massive, I mean it blocks the artery coming off the top of the heart that goes to the lungs. Smaller pulmonary, pulmonary emboli can go out into smaller branches of the lungs. Sometimes they're completely asymptomatic. Um, sometimes they're symptomatic. Sometimes they can be life-threatening if the person has underlying conditions. Um, we do always look for pulmonary emboli as part of a forensic autopsy. Did you see any pulmonary emboli uh, in the case of Mr. George Floyd? No, he did not have any pulmonary emboli. Dr. Baker, let's talk about the, the toxicology. D did you uh, seek what's called a toxicology screen uh, in this case? Yes. Would you tell the jury what, what is a toxicology screen? So we actually, we actually use the term expanded panel simply because the laboratory that we use, that's the terminology. Um, but in essence, what we do is we send off one or more tubes of blood, and in some cases urine, to our toxicology lab. And they run a very comprehensive panel looking for a variety of illicit drugs as well as scores and scores of prescription drugs. Um, I expect that you've probably already heard from a toxicologist, so I won't go into the laboratory part of it because that's not my area of expertise. But part of the testing they do is antibodies looking for specific categories of drugs like morphine and related compounds, benzodiazepines, things in that class, barbiturates, and so on. And then the lab can do a variety of other techniques that are often go under names like gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, things like that. And they're, they have the potential to detect hundreds of different medications that way. That's what we call the expanded panel with the lab that we work with, and that's typically what we ask for on most forensic autopsies. And is the lab you work with NMS? Correct. Uh, how long have you worked with NMS labs? Uh, it's been about 13 or 14 months now. Mm -hmm. So for the past 13 or 14 months, would that be uh, the only lab that you would be uh, sending out uh, toxicology panels or screens to? 
from uh, the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office? Yes, all of our postmortem toxicology is done by NMS. Are you familiar with the toxicologist named uh, Dr. Eisensmith? Yes, I know Dan. Dr. Eisensmith uh, testified uh, here just uh, time flies, I don't know if it was yesterday or two days ago, <laughs> but he testified here. Do you have a, um, a, uh, a good opinion of him as a toxicologist? Um, he has been great to work with so far. We have, we have Objection is sustained. Well, you know Dr. Eisensmith. I do. Um, did you examine the contents of Mr. Floyd's stomach as part of your autopsy? I did. What did you note regarding the contents? Counselor, can I refer to my report so that I don't? Yes, speak? if it helps to refresh your recollection. I'm simply going to quote what I dictated as part of the postmortem exam. The stomach contains approximately 450 milliliters of dark brown fluid with innumerable soft fragments of gray white food particulate matter resembling bread. Did you note anything resembling either a pill or pill fragments in the stomach contents? I did not. Did you do any uh, testing of the contents of uh, Mr. Floyd's stomach as a part of the toxicology assessment for Mr. Floyd? So I wouldn't do any testing of that. It is possible that we could send it to a lab like NMS for testing, but I did not request that. Mm -hmm. So were you aware of whether or not Mr. Floyd had tested positive for COVID? Yes, I was aware of that. Not at the time I did the autopsy, but I became aware of that later. Was that uh, significant to you in any way? That he had tested positive for COVID? Yes, sir. I guess it kind of depends on what you mean by significant. This was very early in the pandemic, and we were still scrambling to figure out things like autopsy safety protocols and what we should be wearing. So in that sense, it was significant. In Mr. Floyd's specific case, the fact that he had been COVID positive seven or eight weeks before he passed away did not factor into my cause of death determination because I didn't see any signs of COVID at his autopsy and his lungs did not have any of the stigmata of COVID that I would expect to see under the microscope. So was he uh, clinically uh, symptomatic from your point of view? Um, I can't assess that because I didn't, I didn't know Mr. Floyd when he was alive. As, to the best of my knowledge, he was generally healthy on May 25th before the events of that evening. I'm, I'm unaware that he was suffering from any acute COVID symptoms at that time. Uh, you also know that Mr. Floyd had a sickle cell trait. What can you tell us about that? Sickle cell trait is uh, carried by a about 8% of Americans of African heritage. What it means is that one of the genes that codes for the beta chain, chain of hemoglobin has an abnormal substitution in it. If you just have sickle cell trait, chances are you will go through life and never have any symptoms from it because you make plenty of normal hemoglobin. That's very different than sickle cell disease, which means that both of the genes have that um, gene substitution, and then you have sickle cell disease. People with sickle cell disease can get very severe anemia. They can have sickle cell crises. They're subject to a variety of infections and other complications. But Mr. Floyd didn't have that. He just had the one gene for sickle cell trait. I, I wouldn't even have known that, except that it happens that people who have sickle cell trait, when you take a biopsy of one of their tissues and put it in formaldehyde, which is what pathologists do with all tissue, the formaldehyde can cause cells to sickle as a postmortem artifact. And so when I saw that on Mr. Floyd's slides, I immediately called the hospital lab and I said, do you have a peripheral blood smear for Mr. Floyd? And it turned out they had made a blood smear during his CPR. And so I had a pathologist who specializes in blood disorders look at the slide and confirm there was no evidence that Mr. Floyd was sickling on his peripheral smear during life. I did also have our lab then run a sickle cell quantitation, which means they actually quantify the abnormal hemoglobin in the blood. And sure enough, that came back with the exact number that would be consistent with Mr. Floyd having sickle cell trait. So it, it's really just a fluke that it got picked up at autopsy. In my opinion, it doesn't have anything to do with why he died. All right. 
Uh, what about uh, a paraganglioma, a kind of tumor? I'll, I'll just ask you about the paraganglioma as to whether you found uh, or concluded that it had anything to do with Mr. Floyd's death. So the short answer is I, I don't feel Mr. Floyd's paraganglioma had anything to do with his death. What we're talking about is an incidental tumor that I happened to find in his pelvis during the autopsy. I did look at it under the microscope. The most likely diagnosis is a paraganglioma, but I have no reason to believe that had anything to do with Mr. Floyd's death. Okay. So Dr. Baker, want to switch and talk about the death certificate. Okay. So if we could pull up exhibit 194. First, I'd like to talk to you about the press release report. Okay. And, and ask you first, uh, Dr. Baker, if you would just identify what this is for the record. Yes, what you are looking at is the final press release my office put out once I had reached my conclusion as to the cause and manner of Mr. Floyd's death. Okay. Can you explain to the jury uh, what it means to certify a death? To certify a death as a physician means that you fill in the decedent's cause of death and their manner of death. And if their manner of death is other than natural, then you also have to fill in the how injury occurred box on the death certificate. Death certificates are relatively standard in the United States. Most of what's on them is largely dictated by the Centers for Disease Control. They vary a little bit in appearance from state to state, but the core elements are pretty much the same in every jurisdiction. Most of what's on a death certificate is actually filled in by family members and the funeral director. So, you know, what's the decedent's full name? Where were they born? What are the names of their parents? Did they ever serve in the armed forces? There's all kinds of things that are captured. The medical examiner's primary role, again, as I mentioned, is the cause of death, the manner of death, and the how injury occurred. Um, most death certificates in the United States are actually filled out by clinicians, meaning your primary care doctor that you see that person fills out death certificates for their patients who die of routine natural conditions. Medical examiners get involved when the death appears to be from unnatural causes. Um, in practice, we should be the only people that certify deaths where the manner is ever anything other than natural. So, so doctor, if we could look at exhibit 193. First, would you, uh, for the record, tell us what this is? Yeah, this is, looks to be a um, actual state of Minnesota death certificate for Mr. George Floyd. Um, these, th these death certificates are actually produced by the state, not by the medical examiners. We simply fill in the parts we're responsible for. We push all of those data to the Minnesota Department of Health and then the death certificate's issued by the state. And so that's why what you see here says state of Minnesota on the top. But the cause of death, the other contributing conditions in the manner, that's what I'm responsible for, and that's right in the middle of your display. Yeah, just want to zoom in on that and show it to the jury. I think this is pre-admitted, Your Honor. So if we look at the cause of death, uh, immediate, underlying, other contributing conditions, this would be the section that you fill out then? Correct. Uh, so if we see here under manner of death, is uh, it uh, indicates um, homicide. Um, tell us what does homicide mean to you as a medical examiner? So as a medical examiner, we applied the term homicide when the actions of other people were involved in an individual's death. It's one of five manners of death that we can choose from, the other four being accident, suicide, natural, or undetermined. Um, homicide in my world is a medical term. It, it's not a legal term. From a vital health and public statistics point of view, it's critical that medical examiners fill in a manner of death on every death certificate because from a public health point of view, you want to know how many people committed suicide in your state, how many people died of accidents in a given year in your state. And so it's a, it's a key piece of public health data, but we don't use it as a legal term. So we look at 918, correct? Dr. Baker, in front of the Exhibit 918 is a list of uh, manners of death, the ones you just uh, uh, talked to us about. Natural accident, suicide, homicide, which I've uh, highlighted because it's what you found in this instance, and then undetermined. Uh, would you tell us from uh, your point of view as a medical examiner, what does natural mean? Natural means the person died exclusively of natural diseases. Right, so an example of, uh, of a natural disease might be a heart attack or a fatal 
arrhythmia as a primary cause of death? Those are actually pretty vague terms. We're much more specific. Um, so to your point, counselor, arteriosclerotic heart disease causing a heart attack would be a natural cause of death. A ruptured brain aneurysm from long-standing untreated high blood pressure would be a natural cause of death. Metastatic lung cancer would be a natural cause of death. There's almost an infinite number of potential natural causes of death. And if we look at accident uh, as an accidental cause of death, uh, is a drug overdose um, an example of what could be an accidental cause of death? Most drug overdoses are accidental causes of death. Um, some are suicides. Um, but yes, we do regard most drug overdoses because we don't believe the person intended to die. We do regard those as accidents. Mm -hmm. And we, we know what suicide is. Uh, doctor, what does undetermined mean? Undetermined means that despite the best efforts of law enforcement, the medical examiner, the medical examiner's investigators, we simply never could pin down the circumstances under which the individual died. Um, in any good medical examiner's office, you are going to have a small percentage of cases every year that go out undetermined in manner. Most of those, as it happens, are people who died of drug toxicity, and based on the drug levels, based on the person's known history, we just don't have enough data to know whether this was a suicide or an accident. And so if we don't know their intent, it's often undetermined. More dramatic but slightly less common example, you know, you find a skeletonized body out in the woods. You have no idea why the person was there, how long they were there. There's very little left to work with, so you don't really know what happened. A case like that might go out undetermined as well. Again, much, much less common, but undetermined essentially means we never really did figure out the circumstances. Now, in uh, Mr. Floyd's case, you listed the immediate cause of death as cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement, subdual, restraint, and neck compression. Correct. Mm -hmm. What does cardiopulmonary arrest mean? That's really just fancy medical lingo for the heart and the lungs stopped. The heart, no pulse, no breathing. Mm -hmm. So with respect to the term uh, complicating, am I right in the understanding that this term uh, means occurring in the setting of? Yes. Or, or in other words, cardio, cardiopulmonary arrest occurring in the setting of law enforcement, subdual restraint, and neck compression. Correct. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Baker, can you tell us how it is uh, physiologically that the subdual restraint and neck compression uh, caused Mr. Floyd's death? In my opinion, the physiology of what was going on with Mr. Floyd on the evening of May 25th is you've already seen the photographs of his coronary arteries so that you know, you know he had very severe underlying heart disease. Um, I don't know that we specifically got to it, Counselor, but Mr. Floyd also had what we call hypertensive heart disease, meaning his heart weighed more than it should. Um, so he has a heart that already needs more oxygen than a normal heart by virtue of its size and it's limited in its ability to step up to provide more oxygen when there's demand because of the narrowing of his coronary arteries. Now in the context of an altercation with other people that involves things like physical restraint, that involves things like being um, held to the ground, that involves things like the pain that you would incur from having your, you know, your cheek up against the asphalt, an, an abrasion on your shoulder, those events are going to cause stress hormones to pour out into your body, specifically things like adrenaline. And what that adrenaline is going to do is it's going to ask your heart to beat faster. It's going to ask your body for more oxygen so that you can get through that altercation. And in my opinion, the, the law enforcement subdual restraint and the neck compression was just more than Mr. Floyd could take by virtue of that, those heart conditions. So, Dr. Baker, just a, a point of clarification that frankly occurs to me as you were talking. Um, as a, a forensic pathologist, it, it's not part of what you do uh, within the four corners of your job uh, to try to calculate what Mr. Floyd's either lung volumes or oxygen reserves or that sort of thing would have been, is it? I, I think what you're getting at, Counselor, is the sort of thing that I, that I would defer to a pulmonologist. Those are obviously things we can't measure post-mortem in living people. Clearly, those things are the, the purview of pulmonologists. Right. So, so, Dr. Uh, Baker, uh, we, we did find from the toxicology uh, amounts of fentanyl and methamphetamine in the results from the lab. That is correct. Uh, you didn't mention either fentanyl or meth in Mr. Floyd's system. Um, 
well, you mentioned those, but you don't list either, uh, either of them on the top line as causes of death. Uh, why is that? Uh, well, the top line of the cause of death is really what you think is the, the, the most important thing that precipitated the death. Um, other things that you think played a role in the death but were not direct causes get relegated to what's known as the other significant conditions part of the death certificate. So the other significant conditions are things that played a role in the death but didn't directly cause the death. So, for example, you know, Mr. Floyd's use of fentanyl did not cause the subdual or neck restraint. His heart disease did not cause the, um, the subdual or the neck restraint. All right, so, so these are uh, items that may have contributed but weren't the direct cause. Correct. No further questions, Dr. Baker. Mr. Nelson. Sure. We're going to take a 10-minute break.
Just a reminder, you're under oath still. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Nelson. Good afternoon, Dr. Baker. Good afternoon, Mr. Nelson. I may have just a moment, Your Honor. To So, Dr. Baker, uh, thank you for being here with us this afternoon. Uh, just some follow-up questions I kind of want to break up into two different sections, one about the autopsy and then um, some other questions about events after autopsy, okay? Okay. All right. So you understand, Dr. Baker, that um, through, you've testified in many cases in Hennepin County before? Yes, I have. Dakota, Scott County as well? Not nearly as much, but yes. And you understand that... Uh, as a part of uh, the process of exchanging information, the defense receives copies of, of everything, your reports, meeting notes, prior uh, statements you've given, things of that nature, yes. right? Okay. And um, have you had opportunities to review all of that information prior to your testimony today? To the best of my knowledge, yes. Okay. And ultimately what you testified is in a death investigation, it's, it's much more than just simply an autopsy, agreed? Correct. And in fact, if you, know, you pull your file, it, it usually ends up being a few inches thick, right? We're actually paperless at the medical examiner's <laughs> office, but if you printed it out, <laughs> I, yeah, I guess it would be a few inches thick. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I did, and that's what it is. Uh, I guess I got to get with the times. Um, but ultimately, that file contains your autopsy report, correct? Correct. Death, death certificate, the, the paperwork that you fill out for the state of Minnesota? Y yes. We don't actually get a copy of the death certificate from the state, but everything we put on the death certificate is in our file. Right. Um, and then you also keep track of conversations that you have with people, right? Generally, yes. It's, that's usually more my investigators who are talking to family, treating physicians, uh, you know, hospital records departments and stuff. So you keep sort of a log, so to speak, of today investigator so-and-so spoke with X, right? Again, I don't personally do that so much, but yes, my investigators do. Right. And it's all a part of this file, right? Correct. And then in addition, you obtain any known medical records um, that may factor into your analysis as well, right? Yes. Um, previous, uh, you had received some uh, hospital records from HCMC regarding Mr. Floyd, correct? Correct. But you don't go out and try to search, or perhaps you do, try to search for every f uh, provider that he or that any person generally may have seen, right? In most, in most cases, that's correct, Counselor. There wouldn't be a lot of point in us trying to get every medical record ever generated for a particular decedent. It would only be if I thought it would help me understand the cause and manner of death better. Okay, fair enough. Um, now, I want to talk to you first about um, the word complicating. How do you define the word complicating as you used it as to the cause of Mr. Floyd's death? I use the word complicating the way I think most physicians use the word complications, and I'm guessing that most people who've ever been a patient or had a loved one who's been a patient knows what physicians mean by the word complications. It means that an intervention occurred and there was an outcome that was untoward on the heels of that intervention. So for example, somebody goes into the hospital for hip surgery and they develop a blood clot in their leg. That's a complication. You get started on a new medication for a heart condition and you have an allergic reaction to it. That's a complication. So it's it's an untoward event on the heels of an intervention that that happened. That's that's how I look at it as a physician. Right. And and it could be during an incident as or as a result of an incident, right? Again, we don't usually use the word incident in medical practice, but yeah, it could be an immediate complication as a result of a medical intervention or therapy or it could be what we call a delayed complication. Right. And um there are certain circumstances that precede those complications, agreed? Um, that's a little vague, Counselor. I, I wonder if you could... Well, I mean, in, in any death investigation, you're trying to determine the cause and manner of death, right? Correct. And in this particular case, you obviously took into consideration the police restraint, right? Correct. But you also took into consideration the heart disease, correct? Yes as well as the toxicology results. Agreed? 
Yes. And you factored those in in your uh, in your cause. There's the cause and manner of death. Uh, and then there's the second thing that you left blank, right? And then there's the contributing causes or contributing factors. Yes, the, the term of art is other significant conditions is what you're getting at, Counselor. Yeah. And that's simply just something you have to do for the CDC, or did you take those into consideration as contributing to Mr. Floyd's cause of death? So when you put those on a death certificate as a physician, what you're saying is, I think these played some role in this death. They had a contributing condition. I'm, I'm unaware of how the CDC would mandate what goes on there. Presumably the goal is you put things on there that you believe are relevant. You, you don't list tr trivial stuff on there that didn't play a role. And so if something was significant enough, uh, you put it on, but if it's insignificant and didn't contribute, you leave it off. Generally, yes. Okay. And so in your opinion, uh, both uh, the heart disease as well as the history of hypertension and the drug, uh, the drugs that were in his system played a role in Mr. Floyd's death? In my opinion, yes. All right. Now, again, in terms of your autopsy report, uh, you, you don't generally note negative findings, right? If something is normal, you may just say it's normal, but you wouldn't, you're not gonna take special note to say the heart is completely, perfectly normal. Uh, that's a really long question, Counselor, but I think I can give you a reasonable answer to that. For most normal organs, we have a boilerplate description for what that organ is. So if a spleen is normal, I'm going to give a normal description of a spleen with the weight of that spleen, the same for a liver. Depending on the nature of a particular case, there are, I used this term earlier, pertinent negatives, things that you think might be on the body based on the circumstances, so you specifically seek those things out, and if they're not there, you document them because their lack, their, the fact that they're not present really means something. So I don't know if that answered your question. There's some things that are normal, but they're almost always normal, and we go on to the next step of the autopsy, there's some things that depending on the complexity of the case, the fact that it's not there, you're gonna dwell on that, you're gonna do a special dissection, you're gonna take a picture, whatever you need to do to document that you specifically looked for something and it wasn't there. Okay, and so in that, in that regard, if you note something, uh, whether, whether it's odd or irregular, or it's the negative, right? You're gonna, you, you take special precaution to note those things in your autopsy. Ideally, yes. You Not only do you document that in your narrative report, but you take a picture of things that are there and you document things that aren't there that, that people might have expected to be there. Okay. And it was it's interesting to me that you made a conscious decision not to watch any videos before you perform the autopsy, correct? Correct. And that was to prevent bias you described? In general, yes. Um, I don't want to go into an autopsy with a preconceived notion that I already know what happened because that might tempt you to skip certain steps or not do certain things that could turn out to be relevant. So, and just, just full disclosure, counsel, to fully answer the question, I did see the video that the entire world saw later that day after Mr. Floyd's autopsy. I did not release his body until the following morning. So had I seen something on the video that triggered yet another thought in my mind, I still had the chance to act on it. Right. I did not want that to be in my mind when I physically performed his autopsy on the morning of the 26th. Understood. But you had received some briefing from law enforcement or from somebody to say, here's generally what we know about what happened. It was pretty high level, but yes, I got a phone call from the BCA that, that a man had gone unresponsive in police custody while he was being restrained. He had died at Hennepin County Medical Center, um, and that was largely what I knew going into the autopsy. I, I believe I was aware that there had been pressure applied to his neck, uh, but beyond that, that's pretty much what I knew going into the autopsy. So you were, um, you took special, because you had learned that there was potential pressure to the neck, you took special steps to look at the neck, neck area, shoulders, etc. right? Yes. And because of that, you did this unique incision or this specific incision to uh, lift the skin off to look uh, under the surface, so to speak. That's correct. All right, and we'll come back to that in a second. 
um, you did know, I want to focus on the heart for a little bit. You noted that uh, the heart was dilated. Yes. What causes that? So dilated is just fancy medical lingo for has gotten a little bit bigger than it used to be. Like when you blow up a balloon, it dilates for lack of a better um, lay description. Mr. Floyd's heart was, if I can refer to my report counselor. Can you refresh your recollection? It would. So I described the ventricles, which are the, the two main pumping chambers of the heart, the right and the left, as mildly dilated in Mr. Floyd's case. I would interpret that as being part and parcel of his high blood pressure. Um, that's a manifestation of the heart getting bigger and heavier as it works against that continued high blood pressure over a period of time. Okay. Um, you also took note of the size of Mr. Floyd's heart, right? Um, it's actually the weight counselor, but yes, weight. yes, absolutely did take note of the weight, yes. All right, and that was 540 grams? That is correct. And uh, you're familiar with the papers of DeMaio and Molina on the normal heart size? I am familiar with DeMaio and Molina paper, although the one that I usually use is the Kitzman paper from the Mayo Clinic. Okay. And what's the maximum size of a heart under that standard? So the Kitzman paper normalizes heart weights as a function of your body length and your body weight. Because if you think about it, a very large person is going to have a larger heart than a very small person. So we don't want to penalize people for being too big or too small. That's why you normalize their heart weight. So in Mr. Floyd's case, um, the upper limit of normal for his body length, according to the reference that I use, is 510 grams. The upper limit of normal for his body weight would be 521 grams. Again, he was 540 grams, and so he is outside the upper limit of normal. That means on the bell-shaped distribution of heart weights for a man his size, he's way out on one of the tail ends, the heavy end. Okay. And um, all of these various standards in terms of the weight of a heart, they're peer-reviewed? Um, as far as I know, yes. The reference I use is from the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, which I'm going to assume is peer-reviewed. Right. And as would be, say, DeMaio and Molina's or the Northwestern Studies or any of these other studies? Um, I'm not familiar with the other studies you're referencing, Counselor. The DeMaio and Molina paper, I believe, was published in the American Journal of Forensic Medicine and Pathology, which I know to be peer-reviewed. And you would agree that the larger the heart is, the more blood it needs uh, to provide adequate oxygenation, agreed? As a general rule, I would say that is true, yes. What types of things cause a person's heart to be bigger than normal? The most common cause by far in adults in the developed world would be high blood pressure. There are a number of far less common causes. Um, aortic valve disease could do it if the heart's pumping against a defective valve. There are genetic causes of an enlarged heart. Um, typically, we can tell those by looking at the heart grossly and microscopically. Um, those are much farther down the list than, than high blood pressure, which again is the number one by a long shot. And based on your review of Mr. Floyd's medical records, you determined that he has a history of high blood pressure, correct? Yes, that was, it was very helpful to learn that from his medical records. He was known to be hypertensive. Um, can you describe the narrowing or the stenosis of the coronary arteries in a little bit more detail? I can, Counselor, if I may refer to my report again. Sure. So as I mentioned uh, when I was describing the photographs earlier, he had 75% proximal and 75% mid narrowing of his left anterior descending coronary artery. Again, in most people, that would be the largest of the three coronary arteries. He had 75% narrowing of the first diagonal branch of his left anterior descending coronary artery. And then in his right coronary artery, which in most people is the second largest of the three, he had 90% proximal narrowing. All right. And what do forensic pathologists generally consider to be enough narrowing of the arteries to cause a sudden death? We usually look to 75% greater as, the, as capable of causing sudden death. And are you familiar with uh, myocyte necrosis? Yes. And do you have to have myocyte necrosis to cause a sudden death? No, you do not. In an arrhythmia, there would be no necrosis, correct? So an arrhythmia is, a, is an electrical phenomenon, not an anatomic one. And so I 
I really can never diagnose an arrhythmia post-mortem. We just have to infer that from the circumstances and from the condition of the coronaries. And when we describe hypoxia of the heart, that's the reduction of oxygen to the heart, correct? Correct. And can you, uh, the, can hypoxia to the heart cause sudden death by other means? Or would it just be the arrhythmia? Um, well, there's, there's many ways that a lack of oxygen to the heart could cause death. One could be a sudden dysrhythmia, where the person's heart goes from a normal beat to a non-perfusing beat, and the person would literally just collapse right in front of you. Depending on the nature of the coronary uh, artery disease, a person could have a thrombus. They could present to the emergency room with crushing chest pain and sweating and difficulty breathing. That would be a different mechanism of death. So there's, there's different ways the heart manifests that is not getting enough oxygen, but one of them is, is sudden collapse and death. And um, sometimes people can survive that f for a longer period of time. Survive. The thrombus you dis described? I mean, Cor like, correct, uh, correct. I mean, I, I don't know the numbers, but obviously people can and do survive thrombi on their coronary arteries. That's why we have clot-busting drugs and cardiologists on call for emergency rooms for urgent catheterizations and stuff like that. Gotcha. Now, can you generally describe the conduction system of the heart? Uh, only in the broadest terms, because I'm not an expert in the conduction system of the heart. I have other people I rely on for that, but it's basically the electrical system of the heart. Um, there's a, heart, a part of your heart called the sinoatrial node, and that's like the little watch in your heart that starts every heartbeat. Um, you would be able to see what it's doing on an EKG if you were looking at an electrical tracing in a living person. That's then conducted to another node that's known as the AV node, the atrioventricular node, and then the electrical impulses go out from that to the ventricles that cause them to beat. Um, you can actually see the conduction system under the microphone under the microscope if you take it out and look for it. Um, and there's, on r very rare occasions, we do that. Um, it wouldn't have been necessary in Mr. Floyd's case, but that's basically what the conduction system does. If the conduction system is impaired, what happens? I'd, I'd have to defer to a cardiologist on that because there's so many different ways it can be impaired. Sometimes it's completely benign. Sometimes a person might need a, a pacemaker or even a defibrillator. It totally depends on the nature of the derangement. Which, uh, which of the arteries supplies the, the uh, you, you, that first one, the SA node, the sino? The sinoatrial node? Right. I believe it's a small branch of the right coronary artery in most people. And is that the one that was 90% occluded? Not the branch. I didn't dissect out the branch. But yes, the, the main right coronary artery was 90% narrowed. Um, you're aware also of the methamphetamine that was found in Mr. Floyd's system? Yes. Does methamphetamine further constrict the vessels and ventricles and arteries? I don't know. I'm not an expert in the specific toxicology of methamphetamine. It is certainly hard on your heart in the sense that it does things like drive up the heart rate and drive up blood pressure. I don't know if it's a vasoconstrictor, um, but in Either way, as a general rule for forensic pathology, methamphetamine is not good for a, a damaged heart, a heart with coronary artery disease. Does the amount of uh, the, or the level of the toxicological findings affect whether it's good for the heart or bad for the heart? I don't know that there's a scientific answer to that, counselor, because I'm not aware that there's a quote-unquote safe level of methamphetamine. And um, especially illicit methamphetamine. Right. Uh, no safe level of the street drug versus the uh, amphetamines that are sometimes prescribed. Yeah, so I'm very unfamiliar with any medical use for methamphetamine in approved circumstances. I'm aware that amphetamine is used in some circumstances. That's definitely not my area of expertise. Again, my high-level overview as a forensic pathologist is all other things being equal, methamphetamine is not good if you have um, bad coronary arteries. And um, exertion also causes uh, the, the heart to work harder? Correct. And re th therefore would require more oxygen? Correct. More blood has to pump through to oxygenate you know, the heart and send it to the rest of the body, right? Correct. 
And so in this particular case, uh, we have uh, Mr. Floyd's heart is at least above average size, right? Correct. He has a heart with narrowed coronary arteries, right? He does. There was evidence of a period of exertion uh, prior to his uh, being deceased? Yes, I mean, we're getting outside the autopsy now, obviously, but it's clear from the videotapes that yes, there was a period of exertion prior to him becoming unconscious. So in terms of, in terms of your investigation, you ultimately did watch the videos? Correct. Including the body-worn cameras of the officers? Yes. And did you also, were you also provided with other videos in terms of surveillance videos, additional bystander videos, things of that nature? I was. And were you provided with investigative materials that what people said happened, etc.? cetera? Uh, no, I did not have those. Okay. Have you ever certified a death due to hypertensive cardiomegaly? I don't know how to, M-E, cardio, M-E-G-A-L-Y, megaly? So the answer to that counselor is yes. Um, the term you're going for is hypertensive cardiomegaly which is fancy medical lingo for the heart is too big because of high blood pressure. We don't typically use that term, we just use the term hypertensive cardiovascular disease because it's a little more precise. But, but yes, I have used that or similar terminology. Have you ever certified a death due to arthrosclerotic cardiovascular disease? Yes and similar with similar narrowings of the arteries compared to Mr. Floyd? Yes. In terms of the injuries to Mr. Floyd, the abrasions and things of that nature, um, obviously they appeared to be fresher to you. Would you agree with that? Or they, they do appear to be fresh, but I want to be very careful in my answer. There's not any literature that allows you to date those kinds of injuries with any precision. Um, you know, presumably there's contextual data that would allow us to know that Mr. Floyd didn't have those abrasions, you know, an hour before he died or whatever. If you just showed me those abrasions blindly, could I tell you how old they are as a pathologist? And the answer is no, not with any precision. Right. And in terms of the abrasions that we looked at on Mr. Floyd's body, um, they could have been from the period of time he was restrained on the ground, agreed? Correct. They could have also been consistent with the, the period of time where he was taken to the ground or brought to the ground, right? Well, that would be true as long as there's something in his environment that would explain those abrasions. I mean, it, 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 some of those would take a fairly rough surface to produce. A, a smooth surface wouldn't, you wouldn't really expect that to cause those. Understood, but if you were, if you were in the midst of um, a struggle with police officers and the police officers brought Mr. Floyd to the ground, the moment of impact with the ground could have resulted in some of those abrasions. Objection, Your Honor. It's beyond the scope and calling for speculation. Overruled. Would you mind repeating the question, Counselor? Sure. The abrasion, some of the abrasions that we looked at, it would also be likewise consistent with Mr. Floyd being taken out of a police car and put onto the ground. Same objection beyond the scope of Yes, depending on how he made contact with the ground, if you know if the if the direction of motion is correct and there's enough abrasive force, yes, that contact could explain those abrasions. Okay. Would you agree with the general proposition that the prone position is not inherently dangerous? As far as I know, based on my understanding of the medical literature, that is true. Now, in terms of your autopsy reports, um, there is no, uh, you, you dissected Mr. Floyd's shoulder and neck area, right? That's correct. And you found no bleeding into the subcutaneous tissues of the neck and back, right? That is correct. And there's no bleeding into the muscles of the back, correct? That's correct. And you don't have any section in your uh, autopsy report uh, to describe any injuries whatsoever to Mr. Floyd's neck and back like you do other areas of the report. Um, that's not true, Counselor. There's a special paragraph that specifically describes me dissecting his back and not finding anything. Okay. 
And you took pictures of that as well? Correct. And all of those procedures um, were documented in the normal course of how you, uh, when you conduct a, an autopsy, right? Yes, all of those things were photographed. And you did that so that other people would have an opportunity to review uh, your work, correct? Correct. And you understand that people have done that, right? Yes. Now, you have, I'm assuming, conducted many autopsies in your career? I have. How, if you had to venture a guess, how many autopsies have you conducted? I, I've never kept a spreadsheet, but I would say it's probably in the neighborhood of 2,900 to 3,000. Okay. You've um, done other autopsies where asphyxiation was the suspected cause of death? Yes. Asphyxia is a very common cause of death in my line of work. Uh, you see it manifest itself in many ways, right? That's correct. And there are certain things that you look for in the course of your autopsy to determine whether or not this death would be consistent with asphyxiation. Agreed? Yes and no. It depends on the type of asphyxia you're talking about. There, there are many ways that human beings die of asphyxia. So as pathologists, we're, we want to make sure we know the type of asphyxia that we're talking about because the signs that you would see are gonna vary from one type to another. And including, um, you, you look at the brain for signs of lack of oxygen, right? We do, but to be fair, the brain, the person has to survive the anoxic brain injury for a considerable period of time before we can see anything. In most of the asphyxias that we investigate, we're not gonna see any acute changes in the brain. You look for uh, musculoskeletal changes to the body, right? Again, depending on the nature of the asphyxia, yes. So you may look for perha perhaps if the asphyxia was from the front to the back, broken hyoid bones, for example? Correct. We're specifically looking at things like the muscles of the neck, the thyroid cartilage, the hyoid bone, and things like strangulations and hangings where the, there's pressure on the neck. Okay. And um, you formed some opinions ultimately about the amount of pressure and whether the pressure was applied to the neck, right? Could you be more specific now, sir? Well, ultimately you have your, um, you, you have described your cause of death, right? Correct. And part of your cause of death includes neck restraint, right? Uh, I believe I actually use the term neck compression, neck compression. but yes, that, that is on the top line of my cause of death statement. And in the course of your many conversations that you've had with various prosecutors uh, and law enforcement officers, uh, you, after watching the video, you've made some statements about where you thought Mr. Chauvin's knee was placed. Would you agree with that? Yes. And did you feel that Mr. Chauvin's knee was compressing his neck? Yes. Did you describe it as being more on the back or in this uh, lower part, base, base part of the neck? So in my impression from the video, and I want to be very clear, I have no special expertise in looking at videos. Um, I'm just looking at them as another person trying to figure out what happened. In my opinion, it would appear that Mr. Chauvin's knee was primarily on the back or the side or the area in between on Mr. Floyd's neck. Did you see any evidence that he was uh, occluding the carotid artery? It, it did not appear to me on the video that his knee would have been able to occlude the carotid artery. Um, even if it were, normal people have two carotid arteries and the, the unoccluded carotid artery would continue to supply blood to the brain. Okay. And when you look at deaths by, uh, by manual strangulation, for example, are you also looking for bruising? Yes. You're looking for bruising. Do you, do you consider, do you see that bruising in the majority of your cases or not in the majority of your cases? Well, keep in mind that my decedents, my patients are all deceased. And so if my patients were strangled, it was so significant that they died. And I, I say that because if you were to ask an ER doc for her experience looking at living strangulation victims, you might get a different answer. In my world, we typically see bruises on the outside of the neck. We see abrasions on the neck. We see bruises to the small muscles of the neck. Um, depending on the type of strangulation and how old the decedent was, we can even see fractures of the thyroid cartilage and the hyoid bone. Um, 
and we, we often see petechiae as well, which are little tiny blood spots on the lining of the eyes. Sometimes you can see them on the face, on the inside of the lips, even the inside of the mouth. And, and did you observe any of those signs in this case? No, I did not. And in terms of, you know, when you think about just kind of the classic strangulation, I'm taking my f fingers and I'm, my hands and I'm applying pressure to your neck, even those small fingers, you, you would expect to see bruises consistent with the size of my fingers, right? Again, in my line of work, we more often than not see bruises. Um, you did say consistent with the size of your fingers. That might be true on television shows, but in the real world, there's not a lot of correlation between the size of bruises we see and the size of assailant's hands. But we are looking for those telltale bruises. All right. And in terms of, in this particular case, uh, you, the, the knee, the placement of the knee being a pretty bony, hard, round object, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty concentrated right under the kneecap of the force. Right. And of course, the shin bone is just below the skin, right? Yes. And it's sort of triangular in its nature, right? On cross-section, mm -hmm. yes. And so if a substantial amount of force was being used by the knee or the shin bone on the neck or back area in your line of work, and if that force was sufficient to uh, asphyxiate him, would that, would you expect to see bruising? I would expect to see bruising, but I don't know that the lack of bruising excludes that. What you, you, you and I kind of just pivoted from strangulation, which is really pressure to the front of the neck, to the pressure of the back of the neck. And it, that's just not something that I think we see as medical examiners, pressure to the back of the neck explaining a strangulation. Uh, or an asphyxiation. Correct. So is there any objective medical finding in your au autopsy that shows a sufficient or significant amount of pressure to the back? Again, I think we've covered this. I did not find any injuries to Mr. Floyd's back, not on the outside of his body, not looking at the soft tissue under his skin to make sure I didn't miss any occult bruises. I, I didn't find any bruises on his back. You. Did you find any hypoxic changes to Mr. Floyd's brain? I did not, but again, a person has to survive for many hours before we would be able to see those as pathologists. You're generally familiar with a hypoxic death and how that occurs? Uh, again, Counselor, it really depends on the nature of the asphyxia. Keeping in mind, to, in my world, asphyxia is hangings, it's strangulations, it's carbon monoxide poisoning, it's drownings. There's all different ways people can be asphyxiated. It really depends on which mechanism you're talking about. Well, generally, regardless of the mechanism, would you generally see symptoms consistent with hypoxia? Would a, would a person exhibit certain symptoms? So symptoms is a little outside my bailiwick because we're talking about living people, and I don't treat living people who are suffering from hypoxia of, of any cause. So, I mean, Dr. Dr. Thomas, who just testified, would testify that you may see confusion uh, when someone is going into a hypoxic state. Objection, Your Honor, to the characterization of Dr. Thompson's testimony. Uh, uh, rephrases. Sure. What do you agree to? So, your role as a medical examiner, right? You take into consideration information from lots of different sources. Agreed? That is true. And there may be cases where you um, uh, where you just don't know what's going on, right? You can't figure something out. Could you be more specific? Well, you, you have a, a decedent on, in your uh, m medical examining table, and there appears to be some sort of tropical disease, right? I'm assuming you're not a tropical disease or an infectious disease expert, right? I'm certainly not an expert in tropical diseases. We do diagnose a lot of infectious diseases at the end of the office. But if there's some sort of infectious or tropical disease, you may go to another person and ask that person, hey, are you familiar with this? I don't object to the, the question that is in terms of relevance and beyond the scope. Beyond the scope is overruled. Uh, relevance at this point is sustained. Sure. Do you rely on the expertise of other physicians when you conduct an autopsy? Not always, but I am never above reaching out to clinical colleagues or other pathologists if they have an area of expertise that would help me. 
And part of your job as a pathologist is to attempt to determine whether there is asphyxia in a particular case, right? Again, it completely depends on the nature of the case, counselor, but we are, if it appears to be an asphyxial death, we're always trying to get at the root of how did this occur? Why did this person asphyxiate? And as a physician, you're a physician and a forensic pathologist, you're familiar with what happens to the human body when someone asphyxiates, right? In general, yes. Again, I don't actually see living people asphyxiate. I don't treat living victims of different types of asphyxia in a clinical setting. But in the context of your research or education, you may go to a conference and they're saying, this, here's an asphyxia death. Let's talk about it, right? Here's a picture of someone hanging from all the way fully suspended versus someone who is on their knees and, and suspended forward with a belt or something. Objective questions, very again, relevant. Sustained is relevant. Are you familiar with the symptoms of hypoxia? Again, they would be very general symptoms, and I don't know what the differential diagnosis for those symptoms would be. What would the general symptoms be? Of hypoxia? Right. Probably some form of mental status change in the form of confusion or disorientation. It's incoherent speech? Again, the differential diagnosis for something like that is so long. Um, could asphyxia explain that? Yes, but there are many other things that could as well. When someone is hypoxic, does that cause that person to breathe faster? I honestly don't know. Again, it probably depends on the nature of the asphyxia. I would defer any further questions to a pulmonologist because they're the experts in breathing. Okay. Would you, based on your understanding, you reviewed the toxicology of Mr. Floyd, right? Yes. You'd agree that fentanyl is a respiratory depressant? That's my understanding, yes. And it slows breathing, resulting in lower oxygen levels? Um, it can, yes. And, and uh, similarly increasing the carbon dioxide, correct? Um, what it would do to carbon dioxide would be outside the scope of my expertise. I would defer that to a pulmonologist or maybe a toxicologist. Uh, methamphetamine is a stimulant, correct? Correct. Meaning, again, it causes the heart to beat faster. Correct. It causes the heart to work harder. Yes. It causes constriction of the arteries. I, I believe you already asked me that, counselor, and my answer was I don't recall if that's a specific mechanism of methamphetamine, but I would acknowledge that it increases your heart rate and the work of the heart. So have you certified deaths by overdose? hundreds of times a year. Have you certified deaths uh, as an overdose where the level of fentanyl was similar to the level of fentanyl in Mr. Floyd? Yes. Have you done so where levels were lower? Yes. Or were higher? Yes. What's the lowest level of death of, by fentanyl overdose that you have certified? Uh, without doing a search of my office's records, I. I'm not prepared to give you an answer on that. I know I've seen levels as low as three nanograms per ml and possibly lower. Um, like all death investigations that we do, if it involves a drug overdose, you also want to try to piece together the person's history of how much they've been using it, how long they've been using it, if they're tolerant to it at all. There's a lot of variables that go into it, but, but I've seen levels as low as three. In some cases, even lower if there's other intoxicants on board, such as alcohol or benzodiazepines. So the combination of drugs uh, in any person's system is a relevant consideration. I'm sorry, did you say irrelevant or a relevant? Relevant, a relevant con consideration. Yes, combinations of drugs and interactions of drugs can be relevant. And that's why you included both the uh, heart condition of Mr. Floyd as well as his toxicology findings as other contributing uh, issues in to his death, correct? That's correct. All right. Now, I just want to kind of review with you um, the history of your involvement in this case, if that's okay. Okay. Um, you, uh, obviously, Mr. Floyd was deceased on February, or excuse me, May 25th of 2020, correct? 
Correct. You performed the autopsy on the 26th? Yes. And after the autopsy, uh, you had a meeting with some Hennepin County attorneys, correct? Correct. On May 26th, correct? Yes. And um, do you recall telling them that the autopsy revealed no physical evidence that Mr. Floyd died of asphyxiation? I don't know that I don't know what my specific language is, but yes, that is what I conveyed to them was the lack of anatomical findings that would that would support that conclusion. All right. And you told them that you had avoided um, watching the videos at that point, right? Until after I'd performed the autopsy, yes. All right. Do you recall telling them certain factors that you uh, thought contributed to the death? You don't object on the grounds of hearsay and cumulative. Members of the jury, you should consider any statements made outside of court as possible impeachment of the witness's testimony and not for the, uh, what is actually being asserted. Mr. Nelson, you may ask that question. Thank you. Do you recall telling the Hennepin County Attorney's Office on May 26, after you conducted your autopsy, what you thought the contributing factors were to his death? I don't recall the specifics of that conversation. As far as I know, the only narrative record of that conversation would be what they wrote down. Um, I would be shocked if I did not tell them about Mr. Floyd's heart condition because obviously I knew that the moment the autopsy was done. I, I couldn't have known the toxicology results the afternoon of the autopsy because I wouldn't have those back for several more days. So you found initially that his heart condition was pretty significant, right? Yes, you would know that walking out of the autopsy suite. Uh, you received the uh, you received the toxicology on June first of twenty twenty. Uh, could I refer to my record and see if that's correct? Yes. On or about June first. That is correct. Uh, and I'm going off the toxicology report itself. It appears that it was issued on the morning of June first at seven o four. Okay. Do you recall having a conversation with Hennepin County prosecutors about the significance of the toxicology findings? I recall having the conversation. I don't recall the specifics of it, but I'm certain that I would have relayed the toxicology findings to them. Do you recall describing the level of fentanyl as a fatal level of fentanyl? I recall describing it in other circumstances. It would be a fatal level, yes in other circumstances. And you all, do you, would you agree that one of the causes of the pulmonary edema that you communicated to the county attorneys was also fentanyl? Fentanyl can certainly be a cause of pulmonary edema. Um, as I indicated earlier in previous questioning, it's confounded by the fact that Mr. Floyd had quite a bit of CPR, and so I find the pulmonary edema much less specific, um, given, given that he survived and made it to the hospital for a period of time. Do you recall telling the county attorney's office that had you found Mr. Floyd under different circumstances, uh, you would have determined this to be a fentanyl overdose? So I don't recall specifically what I told the county attorney, but it almost certainly went something like this. Had Mr. Floyd been home alone in his locked residence with no evidence of trauma, and the only autopsy finding was that fentanyl level, then yes, I would certify his death as due to fentanyl toxicity. Again, interpretation of dr drug concentrations is very context dependent. You then were also interviewed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation on or about uh, July 8th of 2020? Um, I, I believe it was the Federal Bureau of Investigation and or the U.S. Attorney. Um, a lot of these took place over video calls and I wasn't entirely sure who was who at all times, but I believe it was those two groups, yes. Um, and that occurred on July 8th of 2020, correct? To the best of my recollection, yes. Right. Were you asked but for type questions? I was. And were you able to form an opinion on but for the involvement of law officers whether Mr. Floyd would have died under these circumstances? Objection, Your Honor, the state is the same. Overruled it. This is not the legal standard, simply uh, his diagnosis. You can go forward on that basis. So I'll answer the question, Counselor. As I mentioned earlier, there were multiple people on these video calls, and at some point there was more than one person asking questions at a time. 
I don't normally think of things in the but for paradigm. Um, perhaps that's a legal thing, but it's not normally how I think as a forensic pathologist. So what I clarified for the U.S. Attorney and the Federal Bureau of Investigation was my opinion as to what happened to Mr. Floyd, and that is he experienced a cardiopulmonary arrest in the context of law enforcement's dual restraint and neck compression. It was the stress of that interaction that tipped him over the edge given his underlying heart disease and his toxicological status. That was also clarified in a letter from the Hennepin County Attorney to the U.S. Attorney, I want to say, within a few days of that meeting because of the confusion around how that meeting was run and the way those questions were asked. Fair enough. Thank you. Again, the labeling this death as a homicide, that is a um, medical determination that you made, correct? Correct. It is not uh, the same standard as the legal standard, agreed? I don't even know what the legal standard is, but there are two different worlds. Okay. Now, in terms of your, again, um, involvement in uh, this case, you have actually testified twice at, in connection with other proceedings, right? Yes. Re regarding the death of Mr. Floyd, right? Yes. And the first of those testimonies occurred 20th of August, 2020? Yes. You understand that those were transcribed and under oath, correct? Correct. And you uh, have had an opportunity to review those transcripts? I have. All right. Uh, the first time you testified in connection with the death of Mr. Floyd, um, at any point do you recall saying that I have to defer to a, some other specialty? I believe I said that multiple times. The first time you testified or the second time you testified? I recall it was much more frequent the second time. I don't, I don't recall how often it happened the first time, if at all. In terms of the placement of Mr. Chauvin's knee, um, would that explain anatomically why Mr. Floyd, would that anatomically cut off Mr. Floyd's airway? In my opinion, it would not. Do, do you testify extensively about the significance of the coronary arteries and the heart disease? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by the word extensively, Counselor. I, if we need to pull out the transcript, we can. I'm not sure what the word extensively means in this context. Okay. You, did, you talked about the uh, issues surrounding Mr. Floyd's death involving his coronary arteries, right? I, again, I have no... I can't quote you the grand jury transcript, but if you'd like to pull it out, I'd be happy to refresh my memory. Sure. I'm almost certain it had to have come up. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? To refresh his recollection as he requested. Let's lay the foundation for refreshing first. In this uh, proceeding, did you testify about, do you recall testifying about uh, how the coronary arteries work relevant to providing the heart with blood? I'm almost I certain that I would have. I can't imagine that I didn't, but I don't recall how extensively that took place without looking at the transcript again. Would looking at the transcript refresh your recollection about your testimony in that connection? In connection sure. with, may I approach? Mm -hmm. um, page four four three one four. Page twenty. What date? 
It does. So what, what was the problem with the coronary arteries in this context? I believe it's essentially the same answer I gave the jury earlier, which is because of the degree of narrowing of Mr. Floyd's coronary arteries, they have a limited ability to supply extra blood and, muscle, and oxygen to his heart muscle when he needs it. Um, on top of that, he's got a larger heart than a man his stature would normally have because he's hypertensive, and so that heart is going to need more oxygen, which those coronaries have a limited ability to deliver. And how do you think the introduction of methamphetamine to that scenario uh, impacts? Again, I can only give that a high-level answer as a forensic pathologist. I don't treat living people who have methamphetamine toxicity, but my understanding is methamphetamine is hard on the heart. It is going to increase heart rate. It's going to increase the work of the heart because it's a stimulant. And in the circumstances of this particular case, in terms of a person with an enlarged heart, narrowing of the arteries, right? And how does the introduction of methamphetamine affect that? And as I just said, it increases the heart rate, it increases the work of the heart. It's not something that I, as a forensic pathologist, would want to see in the blood of someone that has heart disease. Did you describe it as a multifactorial process, the death of Mr. Floyd? That certainly sounds like something I would have said, yes. And then you uh, testified a second time, correct? To the federal grand jury? Yes. Yes, I did. Um, and that was in February of 2021? Yes. And ultimately, uh, you deferred to experts uh, far more extensively in that second testimony than the first, correct? So the short answer to that is yes. The long answer is I believe I deferred to a pulmonologist repeatedly because there were so many questions about things like gradations of chest wall movement and would this, that, or the other thing impair a person's ability to breathe. And at some point I clearly said, look, this is outside the scope of my expertise as a forensic pathologist. I think a pulmonologist would be better equipped to answer that question. I, I'm going to say I said the word pulmonologist at least a half dozen times in that testimony. Do you recall deferring also to emergency medical doctors? Again, it would depend on the context of the question, but I know I did reference emergency medicine doctors because some of the questions were like, when do you think Mr. Floyd really died? It, how, about, how about cardiologists? Yes, if the question was specific to an area that would clearly be a cardiologist's expertise, I'm quite sure I would have referred to them as well. Thank you, Your Honor. I have nothing further. Mr. Blackwell. Dr. Baker, I'm going to be brief. Uh, so if we could look up, uh, you know, Brett, the uh, section on cause of death. So Dr. Baker, take into account the entire exchange you had with Mr. Nelson on Mr. Floyd's uh, medical conditions, on whatever testimony you gave, wherever you gave it. I want to bring our attention back to what's reflected in Exhibit 193. And taking all of that into account, uh, what today remains your opinion as to the cause of death for Mr. Floyd? So my opinion remains unchanged. It's what I put on the death certificate last June. That's cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement, subdual restraint, and neck compression. That was my top line then. It would stay my top line now. And so if we look at the other contributing conditions, those other contributing conditions are not conditions that you consider direct causes. Is that true? 
They are not direct causes of Mr. Floyd's death, that's true, they're contributing causes. And in terms of manner of death, you found then, and do you stand by today, that the manner of death of Mr. Floyd was, as you would call it, homicide? Yes, I would still classify it as a homicide today. Thank you, Dr. Baker. No further questions. Anything further? Council on the Cyber. Sometimes old-fashioned sign language is best. We're going to take a 15-minute break.
Members of the jury, uh, we have one more witness who's a medical doctor, and by best estimates, we would not be done by 4.30, and all the parties agree that you've had enough. We're going to send you home <laughs> and come back on Monday. So uh, we, we would probably be here past 5 o'clock if we go to the next witness, and it's been a long week for everybody, so let's all go home, have a good weekend, don't talk to anybody about the case, and don't read any media, and we'll see you Monday. Uh, let's shoot for 9.15. Actually, it's going to be at least 9.30, so, because we have legal issues to talk about before that, but, so it'll be 9.30, but you can do your usual, usual routine. Thank you.